Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. ...to do is read to you now what Bill wrote that night from the original manuscript of the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous before the other members saw it and forced some changes to it. And I think if we see what was originally written, this whole thing is going to make a little bit more sense to us. So if you'll follow through with us, Joe's going to read it, and maybe by the changing the tone of his voice or pausing, he can really point out these differences. Let's see what he wrote, compare it to what's in the book today. Our description of the alcoholic. That's the doctor's opinion. Some of it in chapter 2 and 3, and of course some of it in Bill's story. The chapter to the agnostic. That's chapter 4. And our personal adventures both before and after. That's Bill's story and those stories in the back of the book. Have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. A, that you are alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. Step 1. B, that probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism. Step 2. See that God can and will. The last part of step two. Now, if you're not convinced on these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away. I think it's very obvious what Bill has been doing with the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. In the reading of those chapters, he's been trying to sell us Three pertinent ideas. A, that we're alcoholic and cannot manage our own lives. Now, if he's been able to impart that information to us through the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters, then we've already taken step one. B, that probably no human power can relieve our alcoholism and see that God can and will. If he's been able to impart that information to us through the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters, then we've already taken step two. The very next statement in the book says, being convinced, we're now at step three. Now that's the fallacy in trying to start with chapter five, because you see chapter five starts with step three. And from three on, the book follows a certain pattern. It tells us why we need to take a step, how to take it, what the results will be. But it does not do that for steps one and two. And used to, I would read how it works, then I'd read being convinced we're at step three. I'd say, well, where in the hell did one and two go? There's no information in the book on how to work them. You know why? Because you don't work them. You don't work steps one and two. They are not working steps. There's no action in those steps. Those two steps are conclusions of the mind that we draw based upon information presented to us in the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. I've always been powerless over alcohol. My life's always been unmanageable because of that. I just did not know that, nor did I know why, until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. There's always been a power greater than I am can restore me to sanity. I just did not believe that he would, nor did I know the insanity I needed to be restored from until I read the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters. Now, if I can say to myself, I'm powerless over alcohol, my life's unmanageable, I've come to believe there's a power greater than I am could restore me to sanity, then I'm through with one and two. And then I'll be ready to go on to three. Joe? Okay, he says, being convinced we were at step three. We're not ready to take step three, we're just at step three which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Well, just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? Well, poor alcoholics got to give up the two most important things in their lives. One is our alcohol and the other is our self-centeredness. And we've got to make a decision to turn our will, which is our thinking, and our life, which is our actions, over to the care and direction of God as we understand him. Well, just what do we, what do we mean by that and just what do we do? Again, it's going to all be tied up in words. And there, and there seems to be three 
key words in step three. That's given a lot of us difficulty in the past. The first one is this word decision. Quite often I hear people today say, well, I've been in AA six years, and my life's still all screwed up. And I don't understand why, because I turned it over to God four years ago when I took step three. No, we didn't turn it over to God when we took step three. We made a decision to turn it over to God when we took step three. And the fact that we've made a decision implies that there's going to be some further action. As an example in my own life, several years ago, Barbara and I made a decision in the fall of the year to go to Los Angeles, California and visit some of our relatives. But we didn't do anything to carry out that decision. So that year we didn't get to California to visit our relatives. The next year, about the same time of the year, we made the same decision. And again, we didn't do anything to carry it out, and sure enough, we didn't get to California. Third year in a row, we made the decision. But this third year was a little different. This time I took the car down and had it serviced. Barbara packed the clothes and a little bit of food. And we got in our automobile and we drove from our home to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Then we drove to Oklahoma City. Then we drove to Amarillo, Texas. Then we drove to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then we drove to Flagstaff, Arizona. Then we drove to Barstow, California. Then we drove to San Bernardino, California. And you know, by golly, one day we ended up in Los Angeles visiting with our relatives. Not because we made a decision, but because we took the action necessary to carry out that decision. And we're going to find from steps 4 through 11... They are all considered to be action steps. And as we take that action through those steps, we will carry out the decision that we're making in step three. Step three is just a beginning. Now, what is it we're deciding to turn over? Well, we're making a decision to turn our will over to the care and direction of God as we understood him. And what is our will? As Joe says, our will is nothing more than our mind. Our will is nothing more than our thinking apparatus. Our will is nothing more than this thing up here in our head that tells us what to do and what not to do. A good example of tying will and thinking together is let's say that some of us are beginning to approach the end of our lives, which many of us are, And we've gathered up a few material things and we become concerned with what's going to happen to them after we pass on. We may go down and sit down with an attorney. And we may say to that attorney, now when I pass on, I want this to go to my wife. Be sure that this gets to my daughter. I want my son to have this and this to go to somebody else and et cetera and et cetera. That attorney will take my thinking coming from my mind that day. Write it down on a piece of paper. I'll sign it. Maybe the attorney will sign it as a witness, and we put it in the safe. Now, a year or two or three later, I kick the bucket. And if my family's like all the rest of them, they're going to call the undertaker, and they're going to say, come get him. Let's get him out the graveyard and get him in the ground as soon as we can. And they'll run me out there, and they'll put me in the ground, and they won't even wait till they get me covered up. They'll all jump in the car, and they'll go right back to that attorney's office. And that attorney will take out that piece of paper and read to them my thinking as of that day two or three years ago when I was sitting in the office. Now, we know that they call that piece of paper a will. Will, thinking, mind, they're all synonymous, meaning basically the same thing. My thinking is where I need that direction. Now, what else am I deciding to turn over? Well, I'm making a decision to turn my life over to the care and direction of God as I understand Him. What is my life? My life is nothing more than my actions. What I am today, right now, as of this moment, is the sum accumulative total of all the actions I've taken throughout my entire lifetime is what's made me what I am today. All action 
is born in thought. Say that again, Charlie. All action is born in thought. It's not by accident the step reads, will and life. Many people read it backwards. They read it life and will. No, it's will and life. Now, if all action is born in thought, then it stands to reason whatever my life is is going to be determined by how I think. If my thinking is okay, then chances are my decisions, my actions are going to be okay, and my life's going to be okay. If my thinking is lousy, then chances are my decisions, my actions are going to be lousy, and my life's going to be all screwed up. Whatever I think is what I will eventually become. Now, I was scared to death of this step when I first looked at it. And I went to my sponsor and I said, I don't believe I'm going to be able to take step three. And he said, why? And I said, because if I turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him, I have no idea what he would have me be. And he may want me to be a missionary. And he may want to send me to Africa or China or somewhere like that. And I sure as hell don't want to go there. And he just laughed. He said, well, at least it wouldn't be in the hands of an idiot, would it? He said, Charlie, let's look back in your lifetime. He said, you've always been a selfish, self-centered, self-willed human being. He said, you've never paid any attention to God's will, anybody else's will. You've always done exactly whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, and to hell with the rest of them. And he said, the end result of that is you damn near destroyed your life and the life of all those around you who cared anything for you. He said, just think. If God could direct your thinking, then maybe it would become better. And he said, if your thinking becomes better, then your actions are going to become better. And if your actions become better, then your life and the life of all those around you who care for you will probably become better also. But he said, left on your own resources, you don't stand a chance. He said, Charlie, you're trying to find a way to live where you can be sober and be peaceful, happy, and free with a little peace of mind and serenity. And he said, if you continue to operate on self-will, you will continue to be restless, irritable, and discontented. You will continue to be filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. And you're not going to feel good. And he said, eventually, your mind's going to start searching for a way to feel better, and you'll start thinking about taking a drink. And he said, the next thing you know, you become insane, and you think you can drink, and you end up drunk all over you again. He said, left on self-will, there's no way that we alcoholics can have the peace of mind and serenity necessary for good, long-term, lasting sobriety. He got it through to me in a very simple way by explaining to me what these words really mean and what really takes place in my life based upon strictly how I think. Now, as far as we know, we're the only species on earth that's ever faced with this decision. As far as we know, we're the only species that have this thing called self-will. Everything else on earth seems to be God-directed. And they don't have self-will, and they can't make those decisions that gets them in trouble. And you very seldom see the other species here on earth in serious trouble. I've never seen a tree hit a car yet. (laughs) Seems as though we're the only ones that's ever faced with this decision. Now, I don't know whether this self-will thing is a blessing or whether to call it a curse. But we're the only ones that are ever faced with this decision as to whether we're going to continue to operate on self-will or we're going to try to turn it over to God and let God direct our will for us. So Charlie just told us how it works, and now the book's going to tell us why it won't work, and it has to do with self, self-centeredness. It said the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will could hardly be a success. That's why it won't work, is because of self-will. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with some, something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, the rest of the players in his own way. If his arrangements would only stay put, 
If only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. In other words, if, if other people would mind and do what he said, everything would be wonderful. The only problem is that other people won't mind. Other people have self-will also, you know, and I didn't know that. I thought they were supposed to live by my will in and around my house. They're supposed to do what I said. But my wives, I found out, have a self-will too, and it didn't necessarily fit with my will, the way things are supposed to be done, and we had a lot of trouble over that. We've... Um looked at this idea about step three. We've talked about decision. We've talked about will. We've talked about life. And Bill has told us on page 60 that because of this self-will thing, we become like the actor that wants to run the whole show. Now, here again, Bill is talking about something he assumes people will know about. Uh, remember, he's from New York City. The theater is great in New York City. Everybody understands about an actor and et cetera and et cetera. And he's talking about the fact that people like us seem to write a script in our mind for whatever it is that we think we ought to be. And we set out in our lives then to fulfill that script like the actor that wants to run the whole show. And not only do we write in our minds a script for ourselves, we normally write in our minds a script for everybody else to follow too. I knew in order for my life to come out right, my wife was going to have to do this and this and this and this, and she would have to be that. My children would have to be this, this, and this, and they would have to be that. Now the only problem is I didn't know and didn't realize that they had written a script in their mind also. And their script of what they wanted to be didn't necessarily match mine. And sure enough, just as soon as I, I tried to put the pressure on them, then they would resist, and then we went into open conflict. It's plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success, because under those conditions, we're always going to be in collision with people, places, and things. Now... Some 12 or 13 years after Bill wrote the big book, they prevailed upon him to write another book called The Twelve and Twelve. And there's always been a lot of question, in fact, a lot of arguments, as to why Bill decided to write The Twelve and Twelve. And I don't guess anybody will ever know for absolutely sure. But he probably had two or three reasons behind it. Number one is he had had extreme difficulty with the fellowship on selling them on the traditions. Nobody wanted the traditions to begin with. And I think Bill felt that if he could put the traditions together in a book with the steps, that maybe the traditions would be more acceptable to people. But I think another reason he agreed to do that is in 1939, Bill didn't know very much about spirituality. Bill was not trained in human nature. Remember, he's a night school lawyer. He studied economics and business as well as law. He was a stock speculator. He wasn't a trained theologian, nor was he trained in human nature. Yet he managed to write one of the most spiritual books dealing with human nature the world's ever seen. Surely, surely, God helped him write the big book. He did the absolute best he could do with it. But 12 or 13 years later, Bill has worked with hundreds of alcoholics in that period of time. He had taught with and studied with and worked with some of the greatest minds in the world at that time. He knew a lot more about spirituality. He knew a lot more about human nature. And I think Bill felt that if he could give us some more information on the steps, that perhaps the new information or the additional information would make it easier for us to work the steps according to the big book. We do not believe the 12 and 12 was meant to replace the big book. In fact, you can't work the steps out of the 12 and 12. There's no directions on how to work them in the 12 and 12. And I think that's why a lot of people really like the 12 and 12, because they can get in it and philosophize and dance around and never have to do anything. But there's some information in the 12 and 12 that Bill always referred to as a series of essays that will give us 
more knowledge, more information, that does make it easier to work the steps according to the big book. And we found that one day in the 12 and 12, and it was at the beginning of step four, two or three pages that, where he talked about the basic instincts of life. And he, he managed to teach me more about me and what makes me tick on those two or three pages than I had learned in a full lifetime of living. And we're going to look at that information for just a moment. And I think if we can really see it, it will show us exactly why we need to take step three. And it's also going to make it easier for us to take step four when we start on it. So let's look at a little picture that we have that we took right out of that 12 and 12, talking about for just a little bit the three basic instincts of life. Bill referred to them as the social instinct, the security instinct, and the sex instinct. And he said, all human beings are born with these three basic instincts. They are God-given. They're absolutely necessary for survival of the human race. Therefore, they must be good things. It is only when we let them drive us and dominate us and rule our lives completely that they become something that's not good that ends up hurting us. First, we'll talk just a little bit about the social instinct. He said, all human beings are born with a desire to be liked, to be accepted, to be respected, to come together in groups with other human beings. And he said, if we didn't have that desire to be liked, accepted, respected, if we didn't have that desire to join together with other people in groups, that sooner or later the human race would fail to survive. He said, under those conditions, we wouldn't be able to provide the food, the clothing, the shelter, that we think things that we need for our survival. He said if we cared nothing about each other, the world would go into complete anarchy, dog-eat-dog -dog situation, and under those conditions, sooner or later, we would fail to survive. So this basic instinct to be liked, accepted, respected, and to join together with others in groups is a basic God-given thing necessary for our survival. He uses several terms under it. He talked about companionship. And companionship is nothing more than wanting to belong or to be accepted. So many of us, when we grew up, we were on the outside of the crowd looking in, wanted to be a part of and knew we could not be, knew that whatever we said, whatever we did would be wrong and people would laugh at us. Companionship, wanting that in our lives. He uses the word prestige. Now, prestige is wanting to be recognized as the leader. And the world needs leaders. Somebody's got to be a decision maker. Somebody's got to be able to say, I guess, even in the old caveman dales, Glenn, get behind that tree with your spear. Joe, you get over here with your rock. And Biz and I will run this sucker through here. And we'll jump him and we'll have... Somebody's got to do that. And usually we'll take one of two directions. Either let me be a part of or let me be the leader of. In either case, it's going to depend upon what other people think of us. If they like us and accept us, we can become a part of or we can become the leader of. He uses the term self-esteem. Self-esteem is nothing more than what we think about ourselves. Usually high or low, based upon what other people think of us or what we think other people think of us. If they seem to like us and accept us and respect us, we feel pretty good about ourselves. If they don't, or if we think they don't, we feel pretty lousy about ourselves. He uses the word pride. Oh, I'm glad I started going to the dictionary and looking up words. I always thought pride is something you ought to have. As a young boy growing up, all I ever wanted to be was a man who walked tall with pride and just a little bit sideways like John Wayne does until I found out what pride is. Pride is defined as an excessive and unjustified opinion of oneself. We either think too highly of ourselves or too low of ourselves, and in either case, it's not the truth. He talked about personal relationships. That's nothing more than our relationship with the world and the people in it. He talked about our ambitions in those areas. 
Ambitions are plans to gain acceptance, recognition, prestige, and etc. are plans for the future. All human beings have these things within them. All human beings are concerned about these things. Now, if we want to be liked and accepted and respected by the world and the people in it, the first thing we've got to do is find out, well, what is it they want from me? Usually society teaches us that as we grow up. And it will differ in different parts of the world. One part of the world, perhaps it's a good education. Another part of the world is to be a large landowner. Another part of the world is to have a large family. Another part of the world, it can be something entirely different. Based upon what society teaches us as we grow up, we in turn draw up our little plans in our head and set a goal for what we want to become in the future. Now, if you're going to reach the goal and you're going to be liked and accepted and respected by other people, you're going to have to work at reaching the goal. You can't just see, sit on your duff and be a bum and have people like you and accept you and respect you. At the same time, not only we have to work towards successful completion of the goal, we'll probably have to make some sacrifices. You know, there are some things that I would like to do as a human being that if I do them and you catch me at it, you're not going to like me at all. And I don't think you and I would do the work necessary to reach the goal, nor make the sacrifices necessary to be liked and accepted, if we didn't get a reward for doing so. And the reward is that great feeling that we get at the moment of successful completion of the goal. Bill said it in his story when he said, I had arrived. How many of us have set that goal? and worked and worked and strived and strived and sacrificed. And the day we reach the goal and they pat us on the back and they say, Ah, oh, Joe, you're a fine fellow. Boy, you're doing great. You really are an okay guy. There seems to be a feeling that comes over us which is really one of those indescribably wonderful feelings. The only thing wrong with it, though, it seems to be just a temporary feeling. No sooner do you reach the goal and you look around and you say, Well, is this all there is to it? And you set another goal. And you work and you work and you strive and you strive and you sacrifice and you reach the new goal and it feels good but it doesn't last long and you set another goal. And it seems to create within we human beings an insatiable desire for more and more of this recognition, more and more power, more and more prestige. And we're not getting it fast enough and they're not giving it to us like we think they ought to and we start taking a few shortcuts. We begin to do a little lying, a little conning, a little manipulating, a little stepping on other people's toes and climbing on their backs. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for other people. They in turn retaliate against us and create pain and suffering for us. It's plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success because under those conditions we'll always be in collision with people, places, and things. The second basic instinct he talked about is the security instinct. And he said all oh, human beings are born with a desire to be secure in the future. Now, I know that in AA we try to live one day at a time, but I also know just about everybody in this room has got an insurance policy. And the purpose of an insurance policy is to protect ourselves in the future. If we were not concerned about the future, we wouldn't provide the food, the clothing, the shelter, the things that we need. Next winter, we would just simply freeze to death. Next drought season, we would just simply starve to death. So this desire that you and I have to be secure in the future is not a bad thing. It is a basic God-given thing necessary for our survival. Now, by the same token, if you want to be secure in the future, you've got to decide, what is it I need to be secure? And once again, society teaches that to us as we grow up. One part of the world, you need $4. Another part of the world, you need 4000 Another part of the world, you need $4 Another part of the world, you need 178 coconuts, whatever it is that they use to measure, bargain, and determine their security by. And based on what society teaches us, again, we draw in our mind a little script of what it is that we think we need to have in order to be secure. Now, if you're going to be secure in the future, you're going to have to work at it. You can't just sit on your duff and be a bum and be secure in the future. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to make a little money. You're going to have to invest that money. And by the same token, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. God, we can't blow it all today and be secure tomorrow. I can't have the new shoes or the new dress or the new suit or the new this or the new that just any time I want it. 
And I don't think you and I would do the work necessary, nor make the sacrifices necessary, to be secure in the future if we didn't get a reward for doing so. And again, the reward is that great feeling that comes at the moment of successful completion of the goal. How many of us have done it? How many of us have set the goal for the new dress, for the new shoes, for the new drapes, for the new couch, for the new home, for the new car, for the whatever it might be? And we work and we work and we strive and we strive. And the day we get that sucker paid off and nobody can touch it, my God, what a great feeling that is. Hell, if it's on the home, we might even call in the neighbors and we'll celebrate and we'll have a party and we'll burn the mortgage. It's such a great feeling. The only thing wrong with it is just temporary feeling. Sooner do I get that sucker paid off and I look around and her house is bigger than mine. He's driving a Cadillac and I'm still in a Chevrolet. He's got a Brooks Brothers suit and I bought mine at Kmart. And that causes us to set another goal. And we work and we work and we strive and we strive and we sacrifice and we reach the new goal and it feels good, but it doesn't last long. It's just a temporary feeling. We set another goal. And it seems to create within we human beings an insatiable desire for more and more and more and more of these material things. And we're not getting them fast enough and they're not giving them to us like they ought to. So we start taking a few shortcuts. We lie. We con. We manipulate. We cheat. We steal. And the instant we do that, we create pain and suffering for others. And they retaliate and create pain and suffering for us. It's plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success. Under those conditions, we're always in collision with people, places, and things. Third basic instinct he talks about is a sex instinct. Now, I know in AA we talk about sex a lot. We laugh about it. We joke about it. I don't think any of us know a hell of a lot about it. But Bill said that all human beings are born with a desire to have sex. Now, it might get turned off by bad teachings or bad happenings, but all people are born with a desire to have sex because if we don't have sex, we're not going to reproduce ourselves. And if we don't reproduce ourselves, then sooner or later the human race is going to fail to survive. Now, by the same token, if you're going to reproduce yourself, just like the other two basic instincts of life, you're going to have to work at it. You know, you can do more work in three minutes of sex if you can last that long then you do all day dig in a ditch. Don't you older guys remember how it used to be? My God, we got through with it. We just fell over sideways. The sweat's just pouring off of us. We can hardly get our breath. We feel like we've died, gone to heaven, come back two or three times. And I don't think we would do that kind of work if we didn't get a reward for doing so. Gets excited, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and that great reward is that great feeling we get both physically and emotionally at the moment of successful completion of the sex act. One of the greatest feelings a human being can possibly experience. But also, just like the other two, it's just a temporary feeling. Hell, you no sooner get through with doing it that you get thinking about doing it again. And it's such an exciting and pleasurable thing that we get to thinking about doing it in different ways. And then we get to thinking about doing it in different positions. And then we get to thinking about doing it with different people. And the next thing you know, we're doing it at the wrong time in the wrong place with the wrong people. And the instant we do so, we create pain and suffering for others. They, in turn, are telling it against us and create pain and suffering for us. It's plain that a life run on self-will can hardly ever be a success because that always throws us in collision with people, places, and things. I like to look at these three basic instincts of life as the utilities of life. You know, this building we're in is a great building, fine, fine building. And within this building, there's some utilities. There's some electricity. There's some way to heat this building. And there's some water in here. Now, this building would be of no use to anybody if it didn't have these utilities in it. Yet at the same time, if this building is to be destroyed someday, it will probably be because one of the... Because one of the utilities in the building has gotten out of control and ends up destroying the building. The basic instincts of life seem to be the utilities of life. They're absolutely necessary for us to survive. Yet by the same token, if they get out of control, they're not handled correctly, then they in turn destroy us just like these utilities would destroy this building if they get out of control. The very things that God gives us for our survival are the very things that will destroy us left on self-will. Now, if all human beings on earth could fulfill the three basic instincts of life at the level that God intends, there would be no conflict on earth today. 
But all human beings have self-will. All human beings fulfill these basic instincts of life at one time or another to the extent beyond what God intended, and all human beings sooner or later come in conflict with other people because of that self-will. Now, if you'll notice on that little chart, a circle coming out of the three basic instincts of life, those are what makes up self-will, those three basic instincts of life. Now, coming out of the self-will circle, there's another little circle called wrongs. That's a word you've got to look at. Somewhere in AA, we got the idea that when you see the word wrongs, it's a list of dirty, filthy, nasty things. But if you go to the dictionary and look it up, you'll find several definitions for it. One definition of a wrong is incorrect judgment of others. A little later on, we're going to find out that's exactly what a resentment is. Another definition of the word wrong is incorrect believing. A little later on, we're going to find out that's what most of our fears are. Another definition of a wrong are the harms and hurts that we do to other people because of the basic instincts of life out of control. Now, if you want to spot a selfish, self-centered human being, one who's operating on self-will, not God's will, but self-will, it's very easy to spot them. They will display these three common manifestations of self. A selfish, self-centered human being is always madder than hell. Damn him and damn her, and by God I'll show them, and they're not going to treat me that way, and blah de blah 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 Selfish, self-centered human beings always scared to death. Can't depend on God. Can't depend on other people. And if we're an alcoholic approaching the end of the road, we can't depend on ourselves anymore, and we've got to be running absolutely scared to death. A selfish, self-centered human being, because of the three basic instincts of life, because they are so pleasurable, will always overdo and create harms and hurts for other people. It's very easy to spot a selfish, self-centered human being, mad in hell, scared to death, and doing the things that hurt others. I had no idea what caused me to do the things that I did that created all the problems I had. But today I see because of the three basic instincts of life, because the fulfillment of them is such a pleasurable thing, that left on self-will, I simply cannot keep from overdoing in those areas. And that blocks me off from any possibility of peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. God gave us self-will. Only God has the power to overcome self-will. Self-will cannot overcome self-will. A sick mind cannot heal a sick mind. We're going to have to have the aid of a power greater than ourselves. Now then I can begin to understand why I really need to take step three. Because left on self-will, the basic instincts will always drive me to do the very things that create the problems that I have, the restlessness, the irritability, the discontent, the shame, the fear, the guilt and remorse, and left on self-will, I simply do not stand a chance. Let's go a little further now with step three. See, these basic instincts of life are God-given and therefore good, not to be misused or loathed, he said. And the only problem is I didn't know that, and I didn't know that other people have these basic instincts of life too, and they're trying to fulfill their basic instincts. And sometimes when mine get over out of whack and I'm using them for more than God intended to, for me to, I'm running into other people's basic instincts, and we have problems. We have lots of problems. And whenever we find two people who are trying to, to satisfy their basic instincts and overuse them more than what God intended for them to be, well, what usually happens, the book says, well, the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think that life doesn't treat him right. He decides to exert himself more. He becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious as the case may be. Still the play does not suit him. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, he's sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, and self-pitying. What is his basic trouble? Is he not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? Is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things that he wants? And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is he not, even in his best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Isn't that what happened to me? I had trouble with everybody I come in contact with. And because I didn't know about my basic instincts of life, 
I didn't know how I was reacting to other people and how they were reacting to me. And on page 62, first paragraph, it says, it's selfishness and self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later put us in a position to be hurt. Would you read that again, please? But we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later put us in a position to be hurt. Based on these three basic instincts of life, the fulfillment of them, which later places us in a position to be hurt. And I was trying to make decisions based on the, the, the fulfillment of the basic instincts which later put me in the position to be hurt. You know, alcoholism, I, self, and me, that's all I was ever concerned with. And I finally was able to see how selfish and self-centered I had become. And a book says, so our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcohol is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us, and God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us have moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. <clears throat> See, he told us how it works. Then he told us why it won't work, because of the basic instincts and because of our selfish and self-centeredness. And now he's going to tell us how it really works. Well, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. If this is a God-directed world, and I'm convinced that it is, then those of us who have been self-directed and also tried to direct everything and everybody around us, we've been trying to do God's business for him. And we're not God. We've just been playing at being God. And we've got to quit playing God. We've got to quit directing not only ourselves but others. It just doesn't work. And it tells us what to do next. Next, it would be decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. Not our suggester, our director. You see, he's got his word right back in now, two pages later. God's going to be our director. He is the principal, and we are his agents. He is the father, we are his children. He said most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. And what was, the, what was this keystone of the new and triumphant arch? That he is the father and we are the children. He is the principal. We are the agent. He is the boss. We work for him. You know, in that other big book that we sometimes refer to, the big, big book, you know, in the front of that book there's a story in there where he had worked for six days and then he rested on the seventh. And to my knowledge, he never did go back to work anymore. Which would indicate that there's any work going to be done around here is going to be me doing the work. You see? He is the principal, and we are the agents. He is the father, and we are the children. He's the boss. We work for him. Most good ideas are simple, and I like to never got that simple idea. I thought it, I used God like you would a, an errand boy. God, get my wife back, get me a new car, get me a job, take care of this, go down to the store and get that. Get these things for me. You see, always looking for God to do these things for me. Never did I ask, God, what can I do for you? You see, a whole different concept in my life. This keystone, or this <clears throat> concept, was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. Now this is our third reference to this wonderfully effective spiritual structure. This time he's telling us what it is. It's going to be an arch. And we're going to pass through that arch to freedom. And the keystone of that arch, there's a stone right up on the top of the arch. All the other stones are cut and they lay against the keystone. If the keystone is right, it will support the entire arch. If it's faulty, it slips out, the arch collapses. The keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which you and I are going to eventually pass to freedom 
is a very simple idea. We're going to let God be the director. Now, this is a radical idea for people like us. We who have been self-directed all of our lives are now making a decision to let God be the director of our lives. Hopefully, God can't possibly make it any worse than we made it. And just maybe, if God is the director, then just maybe things are going to get better. The keystone of the new and triumphant arch. This is our third reference. Step one, willingness was the foundation. Step two, believing was the cornerstone. And now then, step three is the keystone, and we're told it's an arch through which we'll pass to freedom. You see, we're building the personality change already. We don't have to wait till we get to the end of the 12th step to get something out of this. As we go through these steps, we're going to see a positive happening take place each time as we progress through. The personality change is beginning to now take effect. On top of page 63 it says, Now when we sincerely took such a position, <coughs> excuse me, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. You know, I, I didn't know what that reborn meant. They used to come to my house and knock on my door on some of those nights, and they wanted to talk to me about being reborn. And I'm sitting there being drunk, and I'd run them off and tell them to get out of my house and get, don't ever come back. You know what I'm talking about, some of you. And I didn't want them around me, and I didn't understand what they were talking about and still didn't know. And now, since I've gotten sober, I found out a little bit more about that. There was another guy, his name was Nicodemus in that other book, and he didn't understand any more about this being reborn than I did. So he went to this guy who was talking about being reborn, and he said, what do you mean you have to be reborn? Do you mean that I have to go back into my mother's womb and to be reborn? And he said, well, Nicodemus, aren't you educated? Didn't you go to the university? Don't you know that you can't do that? When I'm talking about being reborn, I'm talking about the renewing of your mind. That's what I'm talking about. And you see, I did not know that until I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous away too long. I'm going to be reborn in my mind, giving up old ideas and accepting new ideas. That's why I have to have an open mind. Now we were at step three, the book. And many of us said to our makers, we understood him. God, I offer myself to you to bear with me and to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. Now we thought well before taking this step, making sure that we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. You know, I got ready to do this third step. And those same people that used to come visit me, I hated them. And I knew what they did down at that church on Sunday morning about 11 o'clock. And I couldn't wait to get down there that next Sunday. And I went down there with the express purpose of doing step three. Now, I didn't get down there at 1030. I got down there about five minutes to 11. You know, I didn't want to get there too early. I might hear something that might help me, you see. So I got down there about five minutes to 11, and they asked people to come down and to do the third step prayer, basically. And I went down there, and I did this third step prayer, that just like it says in this book. And that's what I wanted to do. I don't know what they thought I was doing there, but that's what I wanted to do. And I did this third step prayer, and I walked out of that church a free man. I was free of all that old feelings, all that old guilt, shame, and remorse, and I had made this decision to turn my will and my life over to the care and direction of God. And my life has, been, has not been the same since that morning, thank God. It has changed, and I'm living the best I've ever lived right this moment. My life is better today than it's ever been because of the beginnings of step three way back then. And I continue to do step three on a daily basis every single day of my life 
because I truly want that to be done in my life. Sometimes I meditate on this and I wonder what would my, as good as my life is today, what would it really be if I let God direct all of my life and all of my thinking all the time? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Could be better than anything I could ever dreamed of. And life's good today. It's wonderful today. We thought well before taking this step, making sure we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to Him. And I think the word utterly means completely, all the way, the whole ball of wax. I think that's what we need to understand if we're taking step three. Not just part of it, but everything. I hope you don't make the mistake I did. Because when I took step three the first time, I got down on my knees and I began to say the prayer and I said, God, I offer myself to thee to do with me as I wilt and so on and so on and so forth. And when I got through with it, I said, but now God, don't fool with my sex life. I can handle that okay, thank you. And stay out of my money. You take the alcohol and I'll take care of everything else. And today I realize the fallacy in that is that God don't even drink. He doesn't want the alcohol. He wants the whole ball of wax. I think I'm beginning to understand now and how it works when it's said half measures avail us nothing. We could at last abandon ourselves utterly to Him. If God can direct all my thinking, then chances are my thinking in all areas will be okay. Not just alcohol. Sex, money, power, prestige, and everything else. And if my thinking is okay in all areas, my decisions and actions will be okay, and surely my life's going to be okay in all areas. We found it very desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. But it's better to meet God alone, the one who might misunderstand. The wording was, of course, quite optional, so long as we expressed the idea voicing it without reservation. This was only a beginning, though if honesty and humbly made an effect, sometimes a very great one was felt at once. In the beginning, they always took this step with other people. There was no such thing as one of them taking this step by themselves. What they used to do while they were still Oxford Group members, before the book was written, they would go out and talk to an alcoholic out there somewhere tell their stories. And the alcoholic could see himself through them. And he could see where he was powerless over alcohol. And he could come to believe there was a power greater than himself could restore him to sanity. Those were not steps in those days. Those were just ideas. Then they would bring this person to an Oxford group meeting and say, we want to sponsor this person into the group. They'd say, we've been talking to him and we're convinced he knows he's alcoholic. And we're convinced he believes in God. And the group would vote on whether to take him in or not. That's what sponsorship was originally. Then when they decided to take him in, three or four or five of them would take him upstairs, especially in Dr. Bob's house. They would all go down on their knees together and he would make his surrender. And then when they got through, they would vote on how well he surrendered. And if it wasn't good enough, he may have to go back and surrender again at a later date. You know, it's long been known that prayer taken in the company of other human beings seems to have a deeper, longer, lasting effect. You know, we human beings are meant to live with God and each other. We're not meant to live isolated. And we alcoholics have been isolated from God and others for so long that it's difficult for us to begin to reach out to others. But taking step three with another human being is the beginning of the doing away with that isolation. It's the beginning of reaching out and becoming a part of the human race again. Because there we're dealing with others and God at the same time. We alcoholics are the funniest people in the world. You know, when we're drinking, we'll let our family see us every morning in the bathroom, on our knees, hugging the porcelain bowl, puking our guts up, then when we come to AA and try to do something about our life, we're ashamed to let them see us pray. If we take this prayer in connection with other human beings, certainly it's going to be more effective. We don't necessarily have to, but it seems to be better. 
Those that I work with, that I sponsor myself, I insist they take step three with me for two reasons. Number one, if they take it with me, I know they have taken it. That's the only way I know for sure they've taken step three. But the real reason I do is every time we take it together, it reinforces it for me, it makes it a deeper part of my life, and it means more to me on a continual basis as time goes by. I think this is a real good idea. Okay, we've made a decision. We've uttered the prayer. We're done with step three. Now, step three is only a beginning. It's not going to have any permanent effect unless we do something about this. Page 63, bottom of the page. It tells us what to do next. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many... It tells us what to do next. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision... Step three. ...was a vital and crucial step. It could have a little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down the causes and conditions. Now, we've made a decision to let God be the director of our thinking and of our actions. But there are certain things within our minds that seem to block God off from doing that. You know, God gave us self-will. He also threw us out of the garden a long time ago because of self-will. But as he threw us out of the garden, he made a deal with us. He said, if you guys, talking to Adam and Eve, he said, if you guys ever get tired of trying to live on self-will out there, if life becomes so unbearable you can't stand it any longer, he said, all you have to do is freely give self-will back to me. I'll take it back. I'll put you in the garden. And I'll take care of all your needs from that day on. Now, he said, I love you enough, though, that I'll never take it away from you. You will have to freely give it back to me. And the only way you and I can give self-will back to God is to first find out what's within our will, our thinking apparatus, That blocks us off from doing that. And living a life run on self-will as we have, there's been certain thought patterns, certain types of thinking develop and lodge in our mind that God simply cannot direct our will until those things are removed. Our alcohol is but a symptom of some underlying problems. And we're going to have to look in our own head and find out what those things are. And with God's help, do something about their removal. And then God can begin to direct our will. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. Now, I think step four is the most misunderstood step in the whole book. I think we probably had more difficulty with step four than we have any other step. For several reasons. Now, one thing is the older members of Alcoholics Anonymous have been playing king off of the mountain with step four and telling the newcomer how tough it is. By God, you just wait till you get step four. Bah, 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 bah. And we just literally have scared them to death. If we do step four according to the big book, there's not a thing in the world to be afraid of. So fear should not keep us from doing this step. I think the other reason we've had so much trouble with step four is we simply did not understand how Bill Wilson writes. And not understanding how he writes, we didn't see the instructions on how to do step four for a long, long time. They are here. But they're so short and so simple that we alcoholics with our keen intellectual alcoholic minds looking for something more complicated have overlooked the simplicity of the instructions on step four. Let us say today that if we do it the way the book says, it's really not that difficult to do. The other great problem we've had with step four is people naturally don't want to do it, so we tend to procrastinate on it. And we're always hearing the questions of, how long should you wait before you do step four? 
after you take step three, should you wait 90 days or six months? Or what should you do? We heard one of these professionals in the field not long ago counseling people to wait a minimum of two years. And our question back to that professional was, how, how many people have you killed with that statement? You see, we're trying to find a way to live where we can have a little peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. And every day that we put off step four is another day that we're filled with restlessness, irritability, discontent, shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. Another day we don't feel good. It's another day that we're coming closer to the idea of taking a drink in order to feel better. And really, I don't know how many days I could go without eventually ending up drunk, and frankly, I don't want to find out. Bill tells us when to take step four. At once, after step three. That makes sense, doesn't it? Four has always followed immediately after three. And when we take step three, that removes just enough self-will to give us the willingness and the ability to start looking at ourselves. And if we don't go ahead and do it, self-will comes back. We said, oh, I don't need to do this. Well, I don't dare do this. I'm going to wait till I can do it perfect. And we put it off and put it off and put it off and we end up drunk over it. Now, to really see how to do step four, there's two things that we must always look at when it comes to Bill. First thing is, he loves to make comparisons. Using this and using that and comparing the two together to teach us a new idea. Another thing that Bill loves to do is he loves to always use different words when he wants to repeat himself. We still have watched him do this all the way through the book. We watched him tell us a little story about the great ocean liner the moment after shipwreck, knowing full well that we would understand the great ocean liner story, and he used that to teach us something. We watched him use the actor who wants to run the whole show, knowing that we would understand what he's talking about, and he used that to teach us something. Here he's going to talk to you and I about a business inventory. And he's going to compare the business inventory to a personal inventory. Then he's going to tell us how to do the business inventory. And then he's going to turn right around and say, I want you to do the same thing in your lives that I just told you to do in the business inventory. Now, keeping those two ideas in mind, that he loves to talk about something we already know about, to use that as an example, and that he loves to use words that mean the same thing, Let's just kind of sit back, relax, begin to look at a few ideas about step four. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. And I think his first comparison is this, comparing a personal inventory to a business inventory. If you had a business, and let's say it's, selling ladies' purses or men's watches or bicycles. don't make any difference what it is. That if you had a business and you didn't inventory once in a while, you probably would end up going broke. If you didn't inventory once in a while, you wouldn't know. What's been sold out of the store, you need to reorder to put new items in stock to fill up the empty spaces left by those things that you sold. And if you didn't get that stock back in, sooner or later people are going to come in there and there's nothing left to buy. That's one of the purposes of the inventory, to see what's been sold and what needs to be reordered. If you did an inventory once in a while, you wouldn't know what's become damaged. People really don't want to buy that. It is sitting there taking up valuable floor space, valuable shelf space. It sits there day after day after day after day. It's going to cost you money. You probably got borrowed money tied up in it. And if you don't sell it and get it out of the store, it may cause you to go broke. If you don't inventory, not knowing what's become damaged and unsaleable, you wouldn't really have any idea what to put in that place. And a damaged and unsaleable goods simply takes up all that floor space and costs you that money day after day after day. If you didn't inventory once in a while, you'd have no idea how you stood in your business. And under those conditions, you'd probably go broke. And I think everybody can see that. But in our lives, we have a personal business. 
And we got the most important business in the world today as far as we're concerned. And that's the business of finding a way to live where we can find a little peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. And if we don't inventory in our own personal business, chances are we're going to go broke too. And going broke for us, of course, is to go back to drinking. So whether we're dealing with a business inventory or a personal inventory, the comparison is that we'll probably go broke without it. Now then he's going to tell us how to take the business inventory. We're going to take some key words off of this page and put them on this sheet that Joe's got here in front of him. We've divided that sheet into two columns, business and personal. Let's take a few words out of the book. Taking a commercial inventory. Now, Dad Burnham, <laughs> he could have said business again. But you see, he will not repeat himself twice using the same word. So instead of business, we'll call it commercial this time, meaning, of course, the same thing. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding. And Joe's putting fact-finding up on the board. And a fact-facing process. And he's putting fact-facing on the board. It's an effort to discover the truth, and we're putting truth on the board. About the stock in trade, we're putting stock in trade on the board. Stock in trade, that's what's in the store for sale. The ladies' purses, the men's watches, the bicycles, or whatever. One object is disclosed, damaged or unsaleable goods. And we're putting damaged and unsaleable goods up there. And to get rid of them promptly and without regret. And we're putting promptly and without regret up there. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. And once in a while, he'll try to do that. You know, he may say, well, the reason these ladies aren't buying these purses is they just don't understand what's good for them. You know, he made the decision to buy them in the first place. He hates to admit that he made a mistake. He may keep them in there longer than he should. If he does, it's going to cost him money. Is there anybody in here that would have any problem with the statement that Bill just made on the business inventory, that the purpose of the inventory is we're going to try to find the facts, and when we find them, we're going to try to face the facts. We're going to try to discover the truth about the stock in trade, and we're looking for damaged and unsaleable goods. The good items in that store, those that sell every day, they're not going to cause us to go broke. The damaged and unsaleable goods are what's going to cause us to go broke. And when we find them, we're going to try to get rid of them promptly and without regret. And if we're to be successful, we cannot afford to fool ourselves. Anybody got any problem with that? I don't think anybody in here would have any problem with that at all. Watch him. God, he loved words. I don't know what else he learned, but he loved words. He gave you and I a series of words in our step four to tell us how to take a personal inventory, which means exactly the same thing as the words that he's used for a business inventory. We made a searching, and we're putting searching straight across from fact-finding to search out the facts to find the facts. They mean the same thing. We made a searching and fearless, and we're putting fearless across from fact-facing to face those facts as they are, to fearlessly look at them, they mean the same thing. We made a searching and fearless moral. And there's where we got in trouble. We said, oh, crap. There it is. There's that list of dirty, filthy, nasty items. And we don't want to see them and sure as hell don't want to show them to anybody else. Now, I'm not sure what all Bill Wilson knew. But I know one thing. He knew the English language. And I believe if he'd wanted you and I to make a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items, I think he would have said we made a searching and fearless amoral or immoral inventory. He didn't say that. He said moral. This bugged the hell out of me until finally I went back to the dictionary and looked it up. You know what it means? Why, it means the truth. It means the right and wrong of any given situation. It means things as they really are. The same identical thing is truth. So we met a searching and fearless moral inventory of what? Of ourselves. We're the only stock in trade that we have in this business of staying sober. Nobody else can make us sober. Nobody else can make us drink. Oh, I'll agree they can make us thirsty as hell. 
but they can't make us drink. We determine whether we drink or not. Now, what part of us determines whether we drink or not? Is it our mind or is it our body? The real problem, the alcoholic centers in the mind rather than the body. How I think will determine whether I drink or not. So I'm going to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of my thoughts to see what blocks me off from the sunlight of the Spirit. Now there are certain thoughts in my mind that entirely blocks God out. We looked at them a while ago when we looked at the self chart. Resentment, fear, guilt, and remorse. And when I find those and identify them, I'm going to try to get rid of them promptly and without regret. I'm going to do the same thing in my personal life with my thoughts that he just told us to do in the business inventory with the stock in trade. The way I think is my stock in trade. If my thinking is okay, my business will be okay. If my thinking is not okay, my business won't be okay. How many times have you and I heard stinking thinking leads to drinking? When the businessman inventories his business, he doesn't look at what used to be in that store 25 years ago. And he doesn't look at what he's going to put in the store 10 years in the future. He looks to see what's in that store right now today. As I inventory my stock in trade, I'm not going to look at what was there 25 years ago. I'm not going to look at what's there tomorrow. I'm going to look at what's there today. Because the way I think today will determine whether I'm sober tomorrow or not. So if my thinking today is okay, I'll probably be sober tomorrow. If it's lousy, I'll probably be drunk. He says, we did exactly the same thing with our lives. In other words, doing our lives, what he just told us to do in the business inventory. We took stock honestly, morally, truthfully. Search, we, first, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways or what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. And we said a while ago that the three common manifestations of a selfish, self centered human being are resentments, fear, guilt, and remorse. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease, for we've been not only mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. When a spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Now, we're going to give you an additional sheet of paper the one you've got in your handout sheets, we're not going to use that today. We've come up with a different one that I think is going to be better. And they're getting ready now to pass out one to everybody in the place. And that's going to be our sheet of paper we're going to set them down on. You know, as a human being, there's only three ways we can be sick. If I am physically ill... I usually go to an MD. My physical illness will display certain symptoms. The MD will read them, diagnose, prescribe, and hopefully I get well. I can also be mentally ill. For that, I go to a psychiatrist. My mental illness will display certain symptoms. The psychiatrist will read them, diagnose, prescribe, and hopefully I get well. The only other way I can be sick is to be spiritually sick. A spiritually ill human being is one who's blocked from God, can't receive God's direction and God's power in their life. It displays certain symptoms also, and they are resentment, fear, guilt, and remorse. So we're going to look at those symptoms. We're going to see the truth of them. We're going to see where they come from. We're going to see how to get rid of them. And the most important thing of all is we're going to see how to live in the future without them coming back. And then God can begin to direct our thinking. You know, I like to look at my head up here as a little bitty store. Just a little bitty one. 
a little handy stop, a little quick stop, a little quick trip or 7-Eleven, not very much. And in my store up here, I have a display case right over here. And it's filled with resentment. Damn him. Damn her. By God, I'll show them. They shouldn't have done me that way. They'll never do that to me again. And on and on. And that display case is already full. God can't get in there because it's already full. Over here in this part of my store, I've got a little file cabinet that's filled with fear. Oh, my God. What's she going to do when she finds out? Oh, my God. What's going to happen when the check hits the bank? Oh, my God. I hope the boss never knows about this one. Oh, my God. And on and on and on. That file cabinet's already full. God can't get in there. Back here in the back of my store, I've got a storage room. And it's filled with guilt and remorse and fear associated with those things I've done in the past to hurt other people. God's thinking can't get in that room. It's already full. Now, if I want God to direct my thinking, I'm going to have to do something about the removal of these things. And then and then only can God's thinking come in. My book is getting ready to show me exactly how to do that. Joe? In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Now, the sheet that we have given you, we want to emphasize, this is not anything new. We're not trying to bring another inventory into AA. We've got enough of that already. We don't need another inventory. The sheet that you're looking at, you have on it five columns. The first three columns, column one, two, and three, they are nothing in the world but page 65 in the blank form. Now, one of our problems has always been page 65 is already filled out. And we didn't know the procedure that Bill followed to fill it out. So we're going to start with a blank sheet. We're going to look at the procedure, and then we'll fill it out. The last two columns will be used a couple pages later as a finishing up or a follow-up to those first three columns. That information will come directly out of the big book also. So we're not putting anything new in here, period. Now, as we start to list these resentments, we probably ought to take just a moment to look at the idea of what is a resentment. And the word resentment comes from two old words. The first part of that word, R-E, means to do again or to do over. Anytime you see that in front of a word, it means again. Redo, replay, repaint, or whatever. The last part of that word, sentiment, comes from an old word called centiri, which means to feel. So resentment means to feel over again. Now, in the scheme of life, as we go through life, everybody in the world has self-will. That's one of the problems. Everybody's got self-will. Everybody has the same three basic instincts of life. And sometime in going through life, somebody, because they are sick in their basic instincts of life, they are out of control, they may do something to me that threatens one of my basic instincts of life. In other words, they may do something to me to put me down in the eyes of other people, threatening my self-esteem. They may do something that threatens my personal relationships. They may do something that threatens my material security. They may steal my money from me. Or they may do something that threatens my sex life. When they do that, automatically I am going to react with anger. Now, when they do those things to me, that's not a resentment on their part. That's a wrong on their part for doing those things. It only becomes a resentment when I get angry over it, and then after a while I go over in another room or I go across town, and I replay that whole thing in my mind. And as I replay that whole thing in my mind, I feel that anger 
and I feel that pain that came from what they did in the first place. Now, the second time I play it over in my mind, they did it to me my first time, but I'm doing it to me the second time. A day later, I replay that in my mind again. And I refeel that anger and I refeel that hurt. They did it to me the first time, but I'm doing it to me the second time. Now, I'm not too awful honest with myself. Because it seems as though every time I replay that and refeel that pain, I tend to change the story just a little bit. I tend to make what they did a little bit worse and make what I did just a little bit less. And you let me play it long enough, I can say to myself, well, I was just standing there doing nothing. And they came along and did it to me and damn them and so on and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Only God knows the truth. We human beings know the truth as we perceive the truth to be. And if we replay and refeel this resentment over and over and over, we gradually distort the truth. You know, it's kind of like watching a football game. Let's say we're watching a football game and there's a, there's a little back comes out of the backfield and he gets way out there and the quarterback throws him a pass and that back jumps way up in the air to catch that pass and just as he gets his hands on the ball, somebody hits him. His feet's already about two feet off the ground. And when they hit him, they just turn him upside down. He falls on his head. His arm goes one way. His leg goes another way. And you can tell that it really did hurt him when you see that happen. Now, in the football game, just like the game of life, the football game is going to go on. When they've hurt that back, they're going to do one or two things. They're going to run out there and look him over. And if he isn't hurt too bad, they'll pump a little air in him, get him up, and get him playing again. If he's hurt too bad, they'll drag him off to the side and they'll bring somebody in to take his place. But the game is going to go on. Now the announcer, though, he's got up in his booth a resentment replay machine. After a while, he says, let's look at that again. And this time he slows it down and we get to see it in slow motion and living color and it looks twice as bad the second time as it did the first time. Hell, this time you can see how far that arm really did bend back. You can see how that leg was completely twisted. You can really see the expression of pain on his face and it looks twice as bad the second time as it did the first time. And after a while the announcer will say, let's look at that again. And he'll keep bringing it back and putting it on the screen. And each time he does, it looks worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, the football game's going on, but the announcer's still over here bouncing this guy up and down off the ground. We alcoholics have in our head a resentment replay machine. And we get up in the morning, and we turn it on, and we tune it up in living color, and we shine it on the world all day long, and we record everything they do to us that's bad. Now, we don't record anything good. We don't want to see that. We record all those things that they do to us all day long that's bad, go home at night, replay it in our head, make ourselves sick, and blame it on them for doing so. Now, there's some days that they won't do anything to us. That's a bad day for and an that's alcoholic. that's a bad day for an alcoholic. God, we've got her tuned up. We've got it shining on the world. They won't do anything bad. There's nothing to record. And do you know what we do then? By God, we record what they're thinking. That's what we do. And we go home and play that in our head and make ourselves sick and blame it on them. You know, there's a bad thing about a resentment. Because if you play it over and over and over in your head, you keep throwing it out there. Sooner or later, it's going to turn right around and come right back at you. And when it comes back at you, it comes back at you in the form of self-resentment and we begin to resent ourselves for being in a position to have those things happen to us. And after we play the self-resentment for a while, after a while that becomes self-pity. And self-pity is about the sickest sickness that a human being can have. And we alcoholics love self-pity. 
My God, we like to get up in the morning, put self-pity on as a cloak of dignity, start out the door and say, here I come, mean old world. Just do it to me. I know you're going to do it to me. I know you're going to get me. And my God, we just love to wallow around in that crap. If you don't think we love self-pity, you try to feel sorry for an alcoholic. He will tell you in a hurry, that's my damn job. Don't you be feeling sorry for me. I'll do that. You know, it's a way to fill a sick, sick ego. Because after all, if everybody's picking on you, then you must be somebody important. And it's a sick, sick way to build an ego. And we just get sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker with it. Now, is there any way that God can enter a mind that's filled with that kind of crap? He just can't. Those resentments very effectively block out any kind of good thinking. It's always walling around in self-pity, sickness, remorse, anger, depression, worry, and etc. Resentment is the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. Now, if we're going to do anything about those resentments, we're going to have to see the truth of them first. We're going to have to see where they really come from. Because if they're in our head and we've played them over and over and over, they are no longer the truth. We've distorted the picture and they're really not true. So we're going to have to see the truth about them. And then we're going to have to see how to get rid of them. And then we're going to have to see how to keep them from coming back. And if we can clear them out and keep them out, then God's thinking can enter and take the place of the resentments. God won't do this for us. We're going to have to do this with God's help. Let's see the instructions now on how to handle these resentments. They're here on page 64. The, the instructions on how to fill out the form on 65 is on page 64, but there's a, they're so short and sweet you have to pay attention in the area, otherwise you'll miss them. You know, we have to learn how to read periods and commas and stop and pause where we need to do so. The biggest problem with page 65 is that it's already filled out, and we're not really sure exactly how or what method they use to fill it out. But if you start trying to read page 65 from left to right as we're taught to read from left to right, we start out with Mr. Brown and we put down I'm resentful of Mr. Brown. We write his name down. Then you change your mind from the person to the cause and you have to write down the causes. Then you change your mind again to what part of self was affected by it. You've changed your mind three different times just on one name. Then you go to Mr. Jones and you start put his name down. You've changed your mind again. You change your mind to the cause. And you write down the causes. You see what I'm saying? You get confused after a while. And pretty soon your old head hurts like mine did. And you say, oh, the hell with it. They don't want that anyhow. They want your whole life story. All the dirty, rotten stuff that you ever did. But if you look at the instructions on page 64. And you learn how to read periods, commas, and quotes. Maybe and use those as the instructions. It'll tell us how to fill out this form it says in dealing with resentment we set them on paper so we have some paper and a pencil now we listed people institutions or principal whom we were angry period we stop right there we fill out the very first column from top to bottom rather than left to right we fill them out from top to bottom the people the institutions or principles with whom we're angry. And we're going to have to space them out a little bit to give us some space to write the rest of the columns in. This is really not very difficult to do. I've never seen an alcoholic yet that did not know just exactly who and what by God they're mad at. We spend thousands of hours sitting around in bars talking about it. All we got to do is take it out of our head, put it down on a sheet of paper, you don't have to be sober a long time to do this. You don't have to have a high education to do this. If you can't write, you feed the names to somebody else and have them write them down for you. People is self-explanatory. Institutions, that's those things such as the police department, the Internal Revenue Service, the federal government, the post office, the church, all those institutions we get upset with. Principles are those old, old guiding spiritual principles we've heard all of our lives that interfere with our style of living. Ten Commandments are a set of principles. And when I was out there drinking, I didn't want anybody talking to me about the Ten Commandments because I'm breaking almost every one of them. 
Another old principle I never did like said, what goes up must come down. Another one said, what you give out is what you get back. Another one said, there are no free rides. You'll pay for everything you receive. And my dad used to use one on me that irritated me still to it today. He said, when you lay down with dogs, you'll get fleas on you every time. Those old, old principles that infuriate us. We take them out of our head, put them down on a piece of paper, top to bottom. Now I hope what happens to you is the same thing that happened to me. They came to me and they said, make a list of your resentments. I said, I don't have any. And they said, well, surely you do. Maybe you don't understand what they are. And they explained their resentment to me. And I said, oh, yeah, I got one or two of those. And they said, put them down on a sheet of paper. Now, you'll notice Bill listed four here, Mr. Brown, Mr. Jones, my employer, and my wife. He probably had more than that. He just didn't want to put any more down and use any more space in the book. I started to make my list. And I put my two or three down. And the next thing you know, I had that whole page full. I got another sheet of paper. And the next thing you know, I filled that page. And I got another sheet of paper. And the next thing you know, I filled that page. And I got up there somewhere around 144. And I said, man, you matter than hell at everything. I did not know that. You can only see one resentment at a time in your head. I don't think any of us will ever see how much resentment really does control and dominate our thinking until we get them all down on a sheet of paper for the first time and see how many we really do have. Now, we made a decision in step three to let God direct our thinking. And if we've got that many resentments, then God can't direct it because those things and people and places and institutions that we resent are directing our thinking. And I don't think any of us will ever see that until you put them down on a sheet of paper. We're going to list three on our sheet, a couple off of mine, one off of Joe's, just as an example. The first resentment on my sheet was a lady named Barbara. I'm married to her today. I was married to her 20-some-odd years ago. I love her today very deeply, but I sure as hell had it in for her about 25, 26 years ago. The second name on my sheet was a fellow named Vic. I hated Vic's guts. Joe, what we want to put on your sheet? Put down the word Rose. R-O-S-E. Rose, okay. Oh, what's her name? Rose. Now, we, <clears throat> we had more resentments than that, but we're just going to put those three down, top to bottom, just like we would do with 10 or 20 or 100 or whatever. We fill out that first column. We realize how resentful we really are, how much that blocks us off. And if resentments do it, then God can't. We learn something very valuable just by filling out that column. Let's look at the second instruction. It said we ask ourselves why we were angry, period. We stop right there, and then we use the cause. And very few words, just like Bill did, three or four or five words, we put down the cause. So why we were angry. Always going top to bottom. We go back to each name, and the side of each name we put down the cause of the anger. His uh, reason is so mad at Mr. Brown, his attention to my wife, told my wife and my mistress, Brown might get my job at the office. I don't blame him. I'd be mad at Brown too. Hell, I'm already mad at him. I don't even know him. <laughs> he's mad at Mrs. Jones. She's a nut. She stubbed me. She committed her husband for drinking. He's my friend. She's a gossip. She put his best drinking buddy in the insane asylum. That's what she did. She had him committed. He mad at the employer, unreasonable, unjust, overbearing, threatens to fire me for drinking, padding my expense account. That's unreasonable as hell, isn't it? He's mad at his wife. She misunderstands and nags, and she likes old Brown, and she wants the house put in her name. You tie together like in Brown wanting the house put in her name, it's about time to get upset. We go back to my first name on mine, Barbara. The cause of my anger was... She filed for divorce three times the last year before she came to Al-Anon. God, she's spending more money on divorces than I am on drinking and boozing and everything that goes with it, and I really had it in for her. I used to lay awake at night and dream about her having a, a car wreck, and I always wanted it to be a big truck that run over, and I wanted it to be a trucking company that had plenty of money. 
because after she's gone, I'm going to sue them, and I'll be rid of her, and I'll, you know, I really had it in for her badly. The reason I so mad at Vic is Vic and I had formed a little partnership, and one day Vic just absconded with the funds, just took off. I really had it in for Vic. How about Rose, Joe? Well, I had many reasons, but the main reason with Rose Rose was that she started living with this fellow after we were separated for about three or four weeks, and it kind of made me upset. Living with another man. Living with another man. After all you did... After all I'd done to her. I mean, after all I'd done for her. (laughs) Okay, we filled out column two. Now, I learned something very valuable on column two. As I began to put down the cause, I began to realize... It's really not the people and the institutions I'm upset with. It's what they've done to me that's got me upset. That's very valuable for me to realize that. You see, I'm getting ready to start out on a lifetime process of developing the best possible relationship that I can with the world and everybody in it so I can have maximum peace of mind. Now, part of that relationship is I'm going to ask them to forgive me after a while. But I'm also going to have to forgive them. And when I can separate the name from the cause and begin to realize it's really not them that upsets me, it's what they do, that starts getting names out of the way. And it's going to make it much easier for me to forgive and get rid of some of this stuff in the future. Very valuable information. Let's go to the third instruction. In most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened, so we were sore, we were burned up. On our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal sex relations, which had been interfered with? We were usually as definite as this example. So in the third column, what part of self was affected? We go to the side of each cause and put down what part of self was affected. You can't make me mad unless you threaten one of my basic instincts of life. But if you threaten them in any way, immediately I'm going to feel that anger which will turn into resentment. Let's see what Bill did. He's mad at Mr. Brown and calls his attention to my wife. Well, what did that threaten? That threatened his sex relations? You know, after all, if she gets to fooling around with old Brown, she'll find out he's better than, than Bill is, and she may cut him off at home. No sex relations. It's a threat to his self-esteem. What are gonna, other people going to think about me now if my wife gets to fooling around with old Brown? He mad at Brown because he told his wife of his mistress. Now, that's a threat to sex relations. Because as soon as the wife found out about the mistress, she cuts him off at home. And then she went over there and raised hell with the mistress, and now the mistress has cut him off. No sex relations, period. That's a threat to his self-esteem. What are people going to think about me now? You know, after all, here I'm living in the neighborhood, going to work every day like a good citizen should, supporting my wife, children, paying my taxes. I take the kids out on Saturday afternoon, the Boy Scouts, I teach Sunday school on Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, this little story about me, Brown, my wife, and my mistress has now become neighborhood gossip. My God, what are they going to think about me now? Boy, that's a threat to self-esteem. If you don't believe it is, you talk to Jimmy Baker. Talk to Jimmy Swaggart. They'll let you know in just a minute what that does to your self-esteem. Very carefully, by the side of each cause, we put down the part of self that was affected. The reason I was so upset with Barbara because of the three divorces. Now, what part of self did that threaten? Is that a threat to my self-esteem? You bet you it is. What are other people thinking about me after this? Is it a threat to my personal relationships? You bet you it is. I'm not going to have a relationship with Barbara or the kids. Is it a threat to my security? You better bet it is because when she gets through, she's going to have all the money. She just literally wipes me out right across the board. Is it a threat to my sex life? Sure it is. After she divorces me, we're not going to have any sex at all together. Now, it may only threaten one basic instinct. In this case, it threatened all three. Vic stealing my money. Is that a threat to my self-esteem? 
probably is. What are people, other people going to think about me being stupid enough to let that guy run off with my money? Is it a threat to my security? You bet you it is. He stole my money. Joe, what was threatened with you and Rose? Well, what wasn't threatened? I mean, <laughs> my self-esteem, my security, my ambitions, my personal and sex relations, all of these things have been interfered with. With me, I was totally devastated. I don't know why I should should be, but I was. I was totally devastated by it, completely. I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. It's Very totally carefully. wiped me out. Very carefully, but decided of each cause, we put down the part of self that was affected. For the first time, we begin to see where anger really does come from. I've always had a problem with anger. I've always reacted in anger, and I'd say and do things I was sorry of and say I'll never do it again, turn right around and get angry, do it all over again. You can't do anything about a problem till you understand the problem. I never could do anything about anger because I didn't know where it came from. I thought it was just one of those feelings that flit into your mind. You can do nothing about it. Today I realize anger comes from a threat to one of my basic instincts of life. If you threaten any of those basic instincts of life, you're going to make me angry. And it's how I choose to react to that threat. God, I'm glad that I have learned that. Because you see, I can't do anything about other people. I can't do anything about what they do. But with God's help, maybe I can do something about my reaction to it and not have to get so angry and be in less chance of drinking than I am if I continue being angry all the time. You know, you take old Barbara today. Now, the people that know Barbara today agree with me. If there's any such thing as a black belt Al-Anon, she's one of them. she got about 26 years in the program. she got a fine, fine program. I love her deeply. We have a great life together today. But even today, once in a while, Barbara gets sick in self, just like all human beings do. And someday she may say or do something to me that threatens one of these basic instincts of life, and it hurts when she does that. Now, I've found out that usually one of two things are going to happen. If my basic instincts are under control, if my relationship with God is right, I find that I'm able to say, well, the poor old thing, they're sick too, just like the rest of us, and it'll just slide off of my back, and it won't bother me at all. Now, a month from now, the same lady does the same thing, but I'm not right with God that day, and my instincts are not under control, and I react with anger, and I romp and stomp and raise hell with Barbara and everybody around me all day long. Same lady did the same thing, but I choose to react to it in an entirely different manner based upon whether my instincts are under control and whether my relationship with God is right. My God, I'm glad I learned that. Because I can't do anything about Barbara. I can't do anything about what she does. But with God's help, maybe I can do something about my reaction to it, and I don't have to get angry, and I'm in much less chance of getting drunk. You see, I didn't know any of these things until we started filling out these sheets. I learned three very valuable things from this. Joe? Okay, on page 65, it said, We went back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was this world and its people were quite, uh, often quite wrong. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victory only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Now, it's plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, that we squander the hours which might have been worthwhile. I read that last statement. And I tried to look back in my life and see how much time I've squandered in resentments. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know about me. And when I've got a good resentment churning around in my head... I'm pretty well paralyzed from doing anything worthwhile. All I want to do is just fool with that resentment. And one of my favorite things when I was drinking 
was to get up early in the morning, have a drink of whiskey and a cup of coffee, and turn on my resentment replay machine and replay what she did to me yesterday, replay what he did to me last week, replay what my neighbor did to me last month, replay what my brother said to me a year ago, replay what my boss did to me two years ago, Replay what my mother said to me five years ago. Replay what my daddy did to me 15 years ago. Replay what my uncle did to me 20 years ago. Replay what my grandpa did to me 25 years ago. And I'd sit there and play that thing, and I loved every moment of it, and it would take just about an hour for that tape to run out. And when it ran out, I'd have another drink of whiskey and another cup of coffee, and then I would turn on my get-even machine. Uh, by God, the next time she does that, I'll do this, she'll say that, I'll do, and I'll put, they're not going to treat me that way. And I could spend just about an hour running the get even tape. And I loved every moment of it. I've spent literally thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in resentments. And as I look back at them now, I don't see where they ever did me any good whatsoever. They didn't make me any money. They never straightened up a relationship with another human being. It only made them worse. They never made me feel better. They only made me feel worse and worse and worse. And as far as I can tell, it is absolute wasted time. Now, as a human being, I've only got so much time allotted to me here on earth. And I'm beginning to reach the end of mine. And I'm going to tell you something. For the first time in my life, I'm sober and I feel good at the same time. For the first time in my life, I'm sober and I'm peaceful and I'm happy and I'm free. God, I didn't know you could feel this way. It's such a great feeling that I want every possible moment of it that I can get. I don't have a hell of a lot left. And whatever I've got left, I want to enjoy every moment of it. I don't intend to waste any more of my time in those damn resentments that block me off from God, other people, and any chance for happiness, period. That's the worst, one of the worst things wrong with the resentment. It's an absolute waste of time. And we've all just got so much time. And we've all got so much to waste. And we need to either learn to use it right or we can waste it. Using it right is to find a way to live where we can have this peace of mind, serenity, and happiness. I did not know you could feel this way and be sober at the same time. And God, I love it. But that's not the worst thing. Here's the worst thing about a resentment. But with the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off in the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again. And with us to drink is to die. That's what's wrong with a resentment. It blocks you off from the sunlight of the spirit. It blocks you off from God. And blocked off from God, we don't feel good. And our mind is going to feel bad just so long. And after a while, it's going to start thinking about that sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a couple of drinks. We start thinking about drinking. The next thing you know, we become insane. We believe we can drink. And for us to drink is to die. The main thing wrong with the resentment, it'll cause you to get drunk. Now, if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. We turn back to the list, for it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. Always before, I looked at those resentments as to what did those suckers do to me. Today, when I look at resentments, I'm looking to see what does that resentment do to me. And if it blocks me off from God and causes me to get drunk, I'm now looking at resentments from an entirely different angle. We begin to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. And I stopped and I said to myself, Charlie, how dumb can you be? All my life, I've been proud of the fact that I stand on my own two feet. Nobody tells me what to do. I run my own show. I don't need your advice, thank you. And I suddenly realized 
that as far back as I can remember, other people have controlled and dominated my thinking through my resentments toward them. When I'm resenting them, they're controlling how I think. And if they're controlling how I think, then they're controlling my decisions, my actions, and my life. And I always thought I ran the show. Hell, I never did run the show. Others have always run it for me through my resentments toward them. And then I said, man, you really are stupid. Because some of these people have been dead and buried in the graveyard for years. And they've been reaching out from the grave and they've had me but a yang-yang as far back as I can remember. And when I saw that, I said, to hell with them. I'm not going to let those people live in my head rent-free any longer. I've made a decision to let God direct my thinking. If other people direct it through my resentments toward them, justified or unjustified, then God can't. And it's just about that simple. You know, when I saw that, that looked so stupid to me. These resentments look good in your head. But God, when you get them on paper, when you see what they're doing to you, they look double, double stupid on paper. And we alcoholics fancy ourselves as reasonably intelligent people. And we don't like to look stupid. And I think you'll find that probably 90% of the resentments will disappear because they look so stupid and so dumb when you see what they're doing to you. But there may be one, two, three, or four that are so deeply embedded in our minds that we may have difficulty getting rid of them. We are now coming to the first prayer in step four. We hear always about the step three prayers, the step seven prayer. We never hear about the step four prayers. Let's look at the first prayer in step four. So this was our course. We realized that the people who had wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick, though we did not like their symptoms and the way they disturbed us. They, like ourselves, were sick too. We asked God to help us to show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we'd restore our chance for being helpful. And we cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. You know, I have spent literally thousands and thousands of hours of my life squandering them away in resentment. Because I was a totally resentful person when I got here. And I was always trying to figure out some way I could get even with those people. I mean, I thought every way in the world to get even with them. And I finally figured out a way to get even with them. Listen, if you will, and I'll tell you how to get even with those people. The only way you can get even with those people is to love them. You see? The only possible way to get even with them is to love them. And when you love them, then you're even. And the only way to get even with people is through prayer. See, it's been a long, long time ago that the only way, you, the best thing you can do for other people is to pray for them. It's through prayer. And in my own case, I remember when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I was staying awake at night. I couldn't sleep. I was going to meetings. I would lay awake at night. My mind would be racing uncontrollably. And I went to a conference over in, in Apache, Oklahoma. And Apache, Oklahoma was a little bitty town out in the middle of the prairie out there. You can't get there with an Indian guide and a search warrant, so don't even try. It's just a little old bitty town. But there was about 700 alcoholic Alan, AAs and Alanons out there having a conference, and I went out there. And I met a lady there. Her name was Alabama Carruthers. In Alabama, I just loved Alabama. She was so enthusiastic about this program and just seemed to love life and was just full of life and vigor, and I just loved her. And Alabama was an older lady. And I, I just liked her. And she said something that night that just really struck me. She said, you know, I have peace of mind today. And boy, it just hit me like a brick. And I said, yeah, that's all I've ever wanted was a peace of mind. That's all I've ever wanted was a peace of mind. And I don't know how to get it. So after the meeting was over with, we were in our lobby of this old hotel. And we were talking. It was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. My little friend George had fell over in her lap asleep and it was just Alabama and I and I began to share with Alabama and tell her a little bit about me and how I'd been laying awake nights thinking you know and she said well Joe you're just full of resentments and I said well what is a resentment 
And she said her resentment was old angers and old hurts that are refelt and rethought of over and over and over. And all that anger that you intended to use upon those other people, you're using it on yourself. And you're making yourself very, very sick. And I said, is there any solution to this? Is there any way out of this? I can't seem to not resent then. She said, yes, there is. And she had a purse about this big, about that tall. Great big one. And she reached down in that purse and she pulled out one of these books. And she just flipped this book right over to page 551, just like she knew where she was going. And she said, here, read this. She said it saved her life and gave her peace of mind. And she said it might do the same thing for you. And so I read this piece of information and it changed my life. And if you have any resentments, it might do the same thing for you. I hope it does. But the third paragraph, it said, I've had many spiritual experiences since I've been in the program. Many that I didn't recognize right away, for I'm slow to learn. They take many guises. But one was so outstanding, I like to pass it on whenever I can in the hope that it will help it. someone else as it helped me. As I said earlier, self-pity and resentment were my constant companions, and my inventory began to look like a 33-year diary, for I seemed to have a resentment against everybody I'd ever known. All but one responded to the treatment suggested in the steps immediately, but this one posed a problem. It was against my mother, and it was 25 years old. Now look what this resentment did for this lady. She said, I'd fanned it, I'd fed it, fanned it, and nurtured it as one might a delicate child, and had become as much a part of me as my breathing. It provided me with my excuses for my lack of education, my marital failures, personal failures, inadequacies, and, of course, my alcoholism. And though I really thought I'd been willing to part with it now, I knew I was reluctant to let it go. One morning, however, I realized I had to get rid of it when my reprieve was running out. And I didn't want to, and I didn't, if I didn't get rid of it, I was going to get drunk, and I didn't want to get drunk anymore. In my prayers that morning, I asked God to point out to me some way to be free of this resentment. During the day, a friend of mine brought me some magazines to take to a hospital group I was interested in. And as I looked through them, a banner across the front featured an article by a prominent clergyman in which I caught the word resentment. Now, here it is. He said, in effect, if you have a resentment you want to be free of, if you will pray for the person or thing you resent, you will be free. If you will ask for prayer for everything you want for yourself to be given to them, you will be free. Ask for their health, their prosperity, their happiness, and you will be free. Even when you don't really want it for them and your prayers are only words, you don't mean it. Go ahead and do it anyway. Do it every day for two weeks, and you will find you've come to me, and you want it for them. And you will realize that where you used to feel bitterness, resentment, and hatred, you now feel compassion, understanding, and love. Well, that reminded me of old Rose, and what's his name? You know, I'd been sitting at the bar drinking one night. I got to thinking about old Rose. Hadn't seen her in a while. Decided I might go over there and see old Rose. I knew she would be lonesome. You know, she hadn't seen me in a while. You mean, wouldn't you be lonesome if you hadn't seen me in a while? So I went over there and I knocked on the door. And she peeked out. The, well, what I did was I just broke in, okay? And I got in the house. And there sat an old boy in my recliner, was watching my TV in my house with my wife. And I'm making payments on all this stuff. Well, what are you going to do? Right? You know what you're going to do. And I did it. I jumped on that old boy, and he liked to beat me to death in my own living room floor. <laughs> threw me out in the yard and told me to never come back again. Boy, desire to kill. I used that for a long, long time, and I resented both of them. I thought about killing them a thousand times. You know, I nurtured that and lived on it. But here I am now. I want to have this peace of mind and serenity, and Alabama gave me a solution. So I went back to the little apartment I was staying in. And I began to pray for those people. And by this time, I'm married to another lady who has divorced me a number of times, too. So I've got her on the list. So I began to pray for her and, and for Rose and, that, oh, what's his name? <laughs> and I prayed long and hard. And the next night, I prayed again. And the next day, I prayed again. And this went on and on and on and on. And I don't know how long it was, but it was more than two weeks. And I remember one time, just like it was this morning, it was a beautiful morning, like this morning. This morning reminded me of all those beautiful flowers in bloom. 
And I got stuck at a stoplight there in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at a place at 31st and Lewis, a beautiful, beautiful area, beautiful gardens. And it's just the length of the stoplight. And I looked over there, and the grass was as green and green as I'd ever seen. The flowers were all in bloom. The tulips were all up in full bloom. They were all yellow and red. They were just absolutely gorgeous. And the little squirrels were jumping around in the trees. And I said, my God, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And I said to myself, well, how long has it been since I'd seen those things? And do you know, I could not remember. When they talk about being cut off from the sunlight of the Spirit, I know what that means. Looking back at it today, I could truthfully say that up to that point, everything in my life had been black and white. There had been no color. And that morning I saw the beautiful colors and everything was gorgeous. And that's the morning that I knew that this program would work because I had took some action and I had gotten some results. And from that day forward, I've known one thing, that prayer does change things. I thought prayer changed things, but prayer changes people and people change things. So I was always thinking it was going to change all you people, but it changes me and then I can change the things. You see, and I knew then that I was changed. I was a different person. And I really did want it for them. And I really do want it for them. And I have been free of those resentments ever since. And I don't have them anymore. And today I can drive around and see the pretty flowers and the green gas. And that always reminds me. It always reminds me of where I used to be and where I do not ever want to go again. Because I've been there. And I won't go back. If you've got a resentment, that you don't want to get rid of, for God's sake, don't pray about it. Because if you pray about it, you're going to lose it. If you take each one of these individual resentments, those that are embedded so deeply, and if you pray for each one of them on an individual basis, eventually that resentment's going to disappear. Prayer is probably the greatest expression of love that one human being can express for another. Love and hate cannot exist on the same plane. And as you pray for those that you resent, you will find that the resentment will be replaced by love for another human being. It really does work. Take them one at a time and you can get rid of them. Now just think. Here's an old head that was filled with resentments. This little display case over here was completely filled up. Nothing else could get in there. Now, about 90% of them disappeared because they looked so stupid. The other 10% can be removed through prayer. That means that this display case can be emptied out and become resentment-free. Now, another natural law applies here that says nature abhors a vacuum. There's no such thing as a vacuum or a void. There's always something rushing in to fill it up. If those resentments disappear, God's not going to leave another hole in my head. I've got enough of those already. They will have to be replaced with something else. And the only thing that can replace them is the opposite of the resentment. And where my mind used to be filled with resentments, I find that part of it today is filled with love, patience, tolerance, goodwill, compassion toward my fellow man. I'm in much less chance of getting drunk now than I was before I started this inventory process. You see, there's nothing negative about step four. This is a very positive happening. Resentments disappear. They're replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, goodwill. Well, I'm feeling much better already. And what really amazed me is that I didn't have to go to any other fellowships to find love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill. I didn't have to read any other books to find those things. If God dwells within me, and my book tells me He does, then that's always been a part of my makeup. I just never could use it before. In my chase for money, power, prestige, sex, those things that I thought were the good things of life, those qualities had to be repressed so I could operate on the level I wanted to operate on. But now that resentment is gone, they automatically start coming back to the surface. I've never seen anything like this before. It works just so easy and so simple. 
People say, well, why does it work like that? I say, hell, I don't know why it works like this. I don't even want to know why it works like this. I just know that it works like this. I don't have to understand it. Through the inventory process and through prayer, I can become resentment-free and I can begin to live on a level that I've never known before. In that part of my mind, I'm in much less chance of drinking now than I was before. But it would do me no good to get rid of resentments today if I didn't know how to keep them from coming back in the future because the world's full of sick people and they're going to do it to me again tomorrow. And if I'm not careful, I'll resent. And I can't have just one. If I get one, then I got two, then I got six, then I got twelve, then I got a, you know, a basket case all over again. I got to do one more thing and then we'll be through for the day. Let's go to page 67. Let's look at column four. Let's go to the third paragraph. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. Or had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventories was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them, we placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. I went back to the sheet and I did what my big book told me to do. It said, disregard what Barbara did. Forget about Barbara filing for divorce. Forget about how that threatens your basic instincts of life. Charlie, what did you do? if anything, to set this thing in motion. And I suddenly realized that if I hadn't been out there doing some of the things that I was doing, such as playing around with other women, if I hadn't been spending money on the booze and all the other stuff instead of taking care of my family, maybe Barbara wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. And what I had done with that resentment, I had played it over and over and over in my head. And every time I played it over, what she did became a little bit worse and what I did became a little bit less. And as I played it over and over and over, I gradually transferred all blame to her and made her the devil and made me as pure as the driven snow. And that way I could go ahead and live and do the things I wanted to do and never have to look at myself. And as I went down through my resentment sheet, I never had a resentment on my sheet that I had not done something to them in the first place. A decision based on self. They retaliated against me and created pain and suffering for me. I, in turn, resented them for doing so. And as I played it over and over and over, I distorted the picture, transferred all blame to them, made me as pure as the driven snow. What did I do in the case of Vic? You know, Vic stole my money. Vic was a threat to all those things. But what did I do, if anything, to set it in motion? I suddenly realized that if I hadn't have been so selfish, I wouldn't have gone to Vic in the first place. He didn't come to me. I went to him. And he had something that I needed. He had some money and expertise I didn't have. And I conned Vic into being my partner. And I put myself through my own selfishness in that position to be hurt. I could have cared less about Vic. Now, that doesn't excuse what Vic did. But it showed me the part that I played in it. And as I went down that list, every one of them, I had done something to them that created this thing in the first place. Then I went to the next column, number five, where I had been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, or inconsiderate. Which of the above 
character defects caused me to do what I did or caused me to want to hold on to my old resentment even though I may have done nothing to cause it. The resentment is the wrong. But what's the real truth about that wrong? What's the real nature of that wrong? What's the inherent characteristic about it? If I hadn't have been so selfish, I wouldn't have been running around playing with other women behind Barbara's back. If I hadn't have been so dishonest, I wouldn't have been sneaking around behind her back and lying to her. If I really considered my wife and my children more than I did myself, I wouldn't have been out there doing the things I was doing. And Barbara probably never would have filed for divorce in the first place. I began to see the character defects that I had developed by living over a period of years running on self-will. And I saw where I'd become a very selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate human being. And because of those character defects, I did the things that caused Barbara to file for the divorce in the first place. Because of my character defects, I did the thing with Vic that caused me to get hurt in the first place. Because of my character defects, I did the thing that caused me to hurt every one of them that retaliated against me. And I began to see in that fourth column something I didn't like. And I began to see in that fourth column that if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, I'm going to keep right on doing the same things I've always done. I'm going to keep right on hurting people and institutions. And they're going to retaliate. I'm going to resent. I'm going to distort the picture. I'm going to transfer all blame to them. And eventually it will block me off from God and I end up drunk over it. For the first time, I honestly, truthfully looked at me. And I didn't like what I saw. And I don't believe any of us will ever see the truth about these resentments until we take an honest, truthful, moral inventory and see the part that we played, see what we did, and see which character defect caused it. Those character defects listed in the fifth column are the major character defects that all human beings have. All the rest of them stem from those four. And if I stay that way, then there's no chance of me having peace of mind in the future. If I can change that, then maybe I'll quit hurting people and institutions. Maybe they won't retaliate. And maybe I won't have to resent in the future. If I don't change it, then I simply do not stand a chance. Joe, how about you and Rose? Well, I tell you, my dear was so sick it was unreal. And it wasn't her, it was all me. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that uh, I was 100% wrong, which I'm just going to look at the 50% that I was wrong. You know, I know today that uh, any time there's an argument going on in anybody, that there's two 50% make 100%. And I don't ever accept 100% of everything. But I know one thing, that I was a very selfish individual and a very dishonest individual, a very self-seeking and frightened individual and inconsiderate individual long before I ever met uh, Rose or Phyllis. I was this way for a long, long time. Because I remember many, many years ago, I said, if I ever get big enough, they can't catch me. I'm not going to go to church, and I'm not going to do anything I don't want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it. I don't give a damn who knows it. And every time they would divorce me and put me out, that's what I would say to myself and to hell with them. And that's the way I lived my life. So I was all those things long before I ever met them. It wasn't their fault. Never their fault that I was so selfish and dishonest. I tried to blame it on to them. I tried to say it was their fault. If they had to do this, I wouldn't have to be that way. But that was not the truth. I was selfish before I ever met them. I mean, I was inconsiderate before I ever met them. I would start drinking, and I wouldn't go home. I could not go home. There's no way I could go home. I wouldn't go home. I would say where the party was, no matter how long it was, because that's what I did. I just couldn't do it. And when I would go home, they want to raise, I mean, I'm tired. I mean, I've been out busy, you know, and they want to raise hell with me. I want to lay down someplace and go to sleep, and they want to fuss. And sometimes I'd kind of slap them around a little bit. I become just like my dad. And my dad was in the nut house for doing that to my mom. And I began to do the same thing, you see. I don't have time to tell you all the sickness that was in my family that I grew up with. But I've found myself becoming exactly like he did. 
And that's the way I was. So I was very selfish and I was very dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, inconsiderate, a very sick person with alcoholism. And of course I didn't know that. I thought it was them. And I couldn't, I couldn't see those things until I got it all down on paper and looked at it and could look at the truth, disregarding all of what they did and just look at me. Thank God for the truth. Because I'm not that way anymore. I am not that way anymore, thank God. And I haven't had a divorce since I got married the last time. And I've got, <laughs> and I've gotten married since I've been sober to number two wife. And she has 18 years in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we've been sober about uh, 16 years this time. Haven't had a divorce, haven't gone to jail, haven't had any problems whatsoever. All because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. His wife's name is Phyllis. She says they have a strange and wonderful marriage. She's wonderful and he's strange as hell. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's see what we've accomplished now up to this point. We're in the process of doing step four, the resentment part of it. So let's just write a four up on the top of that sheet. This is a part of step four. Now out there in that fifth column, we now see the exact nature of the wrong that we're going to talk to another human being about when we take step five. We're going to talk about the part we played in it and the part our character defect caused us to do these things which hurts other people. Out there in that fifth column, we're going to see those character defects that we're going to be willing to turn loose of when we take step six. Out there in that fifth column, we're going to see those shortcomings we're going to ask God to take away in step seven. Back in the first column, many of those names are people I've hurt. In my case, all of them Maybe in your case, not all of them, but many of them. They're going to come off of the first column, and they're going to go on to a list to be used later on for steps eight and nine. When we get to step eight and nine, the book says we have the list we made it when we took step four. And many of those names off of column one will be used for that step eight and nine list at a later date. You see what we've really done here? is we've set ourselves up now with all the information we're going to need for step four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, resentment-wise. we got the names of the people we've hurt. we got the exact nature of the wrong. The resentment's the wrong, but what's the real truth of it? Well, the truth of it is because of my character defects, I did those things that hurt other people. And I'm going to be willing to turn those loose and I'm going to ask God to take them away. And with God's help, maybe I can change that fifth column. Without God's help, I don't stand a chance. I'll stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate. And I'll keep right on doing the same things I've always done, hurting people. They'll retaliate and it'll block me off from God. Now I hear you saying one thing. Here's some of you saying, well, Charlie, that's probably right. Based on those people that we did something to hurt them. But how about those that hurt us that we didn't do anything to them in the first place? How about those that hurt us as we were kids growing up? Aren't we justified in having that kind of resentment? Well, I guess we are if we want to get drunk. Because a justified resentment blocks us off from the sunlight of the Spirit just as fast as an unjustified resentment. In either case, whoever or whatever we're resenting, they're controlling our thinking, justified or unjustified. And if they do, God can't. And we'll get just as drunk over a justified resentment as we will an unjustified resentment. Now, if we've got one of those kind of resentments, and we don't want to get rid of it. For God's sake, let's get it on a piece of paper. And let's look at it and let's look at the real truth of it. You know, sometimes we use resentments to rationalize and justify. Not doing things we really ought to go do 
and just as importantly, doing things we shouldn't have done. The lady in the story used her resentment against her mother to justify her lack of education. Bull. Greatest excuse in the world. If mama hadn't have done that to me, by golly, I could have gotten an education. If she really wanted an education, she could get an education regardless of what mother did to her. She used that resentment to justify her marital failure. Bull. Mama didn't have anything to do with her marital failure. If she hadn't wanted it to fail, it might not have failed in the first place. If we've got one of those kind of resentments, let's put them on this sheet. Let's put down their name. What did they do? What part of self was affected? What did I do? If we didn't do anything, we just put nothing. Then we look in the fifth column. What's the exact nature of that resentment? Am I so selfish that I'm afraid to turn loose of that resentment? Am I using it for rationalization and justification? I don't want to turn loose of it. Am I so dishonest that I refuse to look at the truth of it? Am I so afraid of facing life without it that I'm afraid to turn it loose? Am I so inconsiderate of another human being that I can't even begin to realize that those people are sick too? You know, whoever did it to us, not necessarily bad people, they're sick people. And they didn't necessarily do it to us. They would have done it to anybody in that position. If I could begin to consider that, maybe I could straighten out a relationship with another human being before it's too late. It really doesn't make any sense to let those people hurt me 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago and then let them hurt me every day for the rest of my life. Justified or unjustified. If I'm resenting them, they're controlling the way I think. And if they control the way I think, they control my decisions, they control my actions, they control my life, and they have the power to kill me. I'm not going to let those people hurt me 20 years ago and then hurt me every day for the rest of my life. Because you see, I don't have to do that anymore. Before I knew this, I could do nothing about it. Today I know that I can get rid of that resentment. Look at the truth of it. It's not the truth anymore. Oh, yeah, it's based on truth. But if you've played it over and over and over and over, you've distorted the picture and you're not seeing the full, complete truth about it, look at it honestly. See if we're using it for some reason. God, the greatest excuse in the world is to say, if they hadn't have done that to me, then I wouldn't have to do what I'm doing today. Or if they hadn't have done that to me, I could have done something out here. All that is is rationalization and excuse making. It's time for us in AA to realize we are responsible for what we think and what we feel and what we do. We no longer have the luxury of blaming things on other people. We've got to get out of this damn victimization thing we have fallen into in AA. You know, we're sitting around tables and we're talking about what they did to us 20 years ago. And we're trying to figure out why they did it to us. Hell, we'll never know why they did it. What difference does it make they did it? And that's all there is to it. Then we sit around and we talk about why did it make us the way we are. We'll never know that. We just know that they did it. And it made us that way. Now, the only question is, do we want to stay that way or do we want to change yourself? And if we want to stay that way and stay sick, then we can keep right on resenting them. If we want to get well and get rid of that stuff, then we can do it through this inventory process. And if all else fails, we can pray for them. And you can't resent them and pray for them at the same time. You can be free of those resentments if you wish to. And if you don't want to get rid of them, look at it closely because you're using it for some reason to rationalize and justify. I know I've been there and I've used them all for those reasons. I don't have to do that anymore. You know, just think, tomorrow morning you guys are going to be the most beautiful people in the world. Yeah, you're going back tonight wherever you're staying. You're going to work on these resentments. And tomorrow morning you're going to be 100% resentment free. God, you're going to look great tomorrow. Yeah, you are. Golly, there's, there's not a resentment left in the whole bunch. You ought to see you from up here. Most pleasant looking people in the, in, in the whole state this morning. How many of you went home last night or wherever you stayed and uh, worked on at least one resentment? Could I see your hands? 
Oh, yeah, several of you did. How many of you got rid of at least one resentment? Could I see your hands? Yeah, that's great. How many of you did we give at least one new resentment to yesterday afternoon? Can I see your hands? <laughs> Pray for us. We need the prayers and you need to practice. <laughs> We're going to start this morning with the other two parts of our inventory process. and Of course, one of them was fear and, and the other one is is the sex thing, and in view of the sex thing, I'm going to read to you something that, once again, I found in the front of my book when I got home from one of these big book studies one time, dealing with sex. And it said a couple, age 67, went to the doctor's office, and the doctor asked, what can I do for you? Well, the man said, well, will, will you be willing to have us or watch us have sexual intercourse? Uh, the doctor looked puzzled but agreed. And when the couple had finished, the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with the way you have intercourse that I can see. And he charged them $16 for the visit. This happened several weeks in a row. The couple would make an appointment, have intercourse, pay the doctor $16, and leave. And finally one day the doctor, his curiosity got the best of him, and he asked him, he said, well, just... What exactly are you, are you trying to find out from this deal? And the old man said, well, we're not trying to find out anything. He said, she's married and we can't go to her house. <laughs> and he said, I'm married and we can't go to my house. The Holiday Inn charges $75 for a room. The Country Inn charges 60 He said, we do it here for 16 and I get 1250 back from Medicare. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a pretty good deal to me. I might work on that. Go. <laughs> oh my! Charlie won't tell me. Let me tell any stories, but I'm going to tell one anyhow. <laughs> about these three fellows, about like old Glenn there and Charlie and I, and they were about 18, 19 years old, and they were still in the sixth grade. If you can imagine that. And the uh, principal wanted them out of the sixth grade desperately. He called him in the office one day, and he said, boys, I'm going to ask you all a question. And if you get the answer to these questions correctly, you get to go on to the seventh grade. So they asked Glenn, said, Glenn, said, what is it that women have two of that men like to get their hands on? And he thought for a long time, and he said, well, women have two hands. Men like to hold women's hands. He said, well, that's good. He said, you're now in the seventh grade. So they asked Charlie, said, Charlie, said, what is it that men have one of that women like to get their hands on? And he thought for a long time. He said, well, women like to get their hands on a man's billfold. He said, that's good. You're in the seventh grade. And he looked at me and he said, now, Joe, I'm going to ask you a simple question. And I said, God, I hope so. I missed those first two. <laughs> <laughs> the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind <laughs> rather than in his body. <laughs> we, uh, we've been talking about these three common manifestations of self, these three damaged and unsaleable <clears throat> goods in our minds that seems to block us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. And we said all along yesterday you could tell a selfish, self-centered human being, one who is operating on self-will only, because of those three manifestations. And we talked about they always would be very mad, always upset, always angry. We talked about the fact that they would be filled with fear, can't depend on God, can't depend on other people, and if we're reaching the end of the road in our alcoholism, we can no longer depend upon ourselves. And then we said the other common manifestation was the guilt and the remorse associated with the people we've heard in the past. So yesterday evening or yesterday afternoon, we looked at that first common manifestation called resentment. And we found out a lot about resentments. We found out where they came from. Uh, we found out uh, that they really came from a threat to one of the basic instincts of life. Uh, we found out the part that we played in most of those resentments. We found that usually we had done something based on the three basic instincts of life which created a problem for others. They, in turn, had retaliated against us. We, in turn, through resentments then, 
transferred all blame from ourselves to other people. Because every time we played the resentment over and over, we distorted the picture just a little bit, finally transferred all blame to them, made ourselves as pure as the driven snow. And we, we have to develop those kind of skills as a practicing alcoholic. Because if you and I really had to live with what we're doing whenever we're drinking, I doubt very seriously if we could live with that. But we don't ever really have to look at that stuff when we're drinking because we can transfer all blame to others through those resentments. And we begin to see the reason we really, really love those resentments is simply to be able to transfer blame to others and then go ahead and live life the way we wanted to live it. We found out in reviewing those resentments, the book finally asked us to go back and look at the part we played to see what we actually did to hurt those people. And then it asked us to look at the exact nature of that resentment. The resentment being the wrong, that's what blocks us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. But then it asked us to look and see where we had been selfish, where we had been dishonest, where we had been self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate. And we found that in most cases, based on those character defects, we in turn had done those things that created the problems in the first place. And we began to see through that little resentment process that if we didn't do something about the kind of personality that we had become, if we weren't willing to do something about those character defects, well, we would simply keep right on doing the same things we've always done, keep right on hurting people, they, in turn, would hurt us, and we, in turn, would resent, and that would block us off from God, and eventually we would get drunk over it. What we really found in that inventory sheet as we finished it up, that we were doing a part of step four, the resentment part, and out in the fifth column there, we found the exact nature of the wrong that we were going to talk to another human being about whenever we took step five. In that fifth column, we found the defects of character we're going to become willing to turn loose of in six, the shortcomings we're going to ask God to take away in seven. And then quite naturally, many of the names in column one would come off of that sheet, which in turn would be used for step eight and nine whenever we get there. When we get to step eight, the book says we have the list, we made it, and we took inventory. So resentment-wise, we set ourselves up for all the information we need for steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Also, we mentioned right at the closing of it yesterday that if we had one of those resentments from the past where people had done something to us that we had nothing to do with it, that we didn't do something to set in motion those circumstances which caused people to hurt us, if people just outright hurt us, maybe as a child growing up, and even though we didn't have any part in that particular thing, whatever it was, other than being the one who was hurt, if we're still carrying those kind of resentments, then we really need to look at them very closely. If we're still carrying them, don't want to get rid of them, knowing that they might get us drunk, then we're probably using them for some purpose. We're using them for rationalization, justification, being able to say, well, if they hadn't have done that to me, I wouldn't have to do what I'm doing today. Or if they hadn't have done that to me, then I could be something different than what I am. We need to look at that in the fifth column and see if maybe our own selfishness is causing us to hold on to that resentment. We need to look at that and see if we are being dishonest with ourselves. Are we really looking at that resentment truthfully, or have we distorted the picture to a certain extent? We need to look at that and see if we're so afraid of facing life without that resentment, we're afraid to turn it loose. We also need to look at it and see if maybe we should start being more considerate of other human beings, and maybe recognize that those people that hurt us, that maybe they did it not because they're bad, but because they're sick. And if we can begin to recognize that, then maybe we could start a forgiving process before it's too late for another human being. At the very least, if we can't get see the part we're playing in it, if we can't see why we're holding on to it, then we can always turn around and use prayer 
and through prayer get rid of that resentment too. Even though we had nothing to do with it, the resentment's still going to kill us today if we keep on carrying it. Because a justified resentment blocks us off from God just as much as an unjustified resentment. And we simply are not going to let people hurt us 15, 20 years ago and then let them hurt us every day for the rest of our lives through our resentment toward them. If we're resenting, they are controlling us. And they are determining what our life's going to be. And they can actually kill us through those resentments because as sooner or later it does block us off from God and it may cause us to get drunk. So even in those kind of resentments, we need to look at those very carefully, work on those, and do our best to get rid of them. And we find that usually we can get rid of those, most certainly we can through prayer, if no other way. Now we don't want to give you the impression that we're always going to be 100% resentment free. God never gave us anything bad. It only depends on what we do with things as to whether they're bad or not. A resentment used for the right purposes can be a very useful, helpful thing. For instance, if somebody does something to me that puts me down and kind of hurts my self-esteem, if it causes me to look at myself and see where maybe I need to do some things to better myself, it may cause me to get up off of my duff and go do some things that helps me and other people. And if I use a resentment in that way, it's actually a helpful resentment. For instance, let's say we're living in the neighborhood and all the old houses are kind of beat up and all of them need painting and window screens torn up and some window panes broken. My house is no worse than anybody else's and I'm very satisfied and very complacent about that situation. I go home from work each evening, I sit on the front porch, and I rock and I rock, and I kind of enjoy myself. But one day I happen to look up and some idiot has moved in across the street. He's out there with a ladder and a can of paint and a paintbrush, and he's painting his house and fixing the window screens, and it makes my house look bad. And I resent the hell out of him. I say, who is he moving in here screwing up the whole damn neighborhood? Now, if I use that resentment right... It will cause me to look at my house and become a little bit ashamed of it. And next thing you know, I paint my house and fix my window screens and my house looks better. My next door neighbor resents me and the next thing you know, he fixes his house. And after a while, God's got the whole neighborhood cleaned up like it should have been in the first place. But we alcoholics won't use that resentment right. We'll sit on the front porch and we'll rock and we'll rock and we'll resent Thirty days later at midnight, we'll go over and burn his damn house down. We'll show him. (laughs) So we'll not always be 100% resentment free. It just depends on what we do with them. If we use them for a useful purpose, great. But if we turn them inside ourselves and begin to resent and resent and resent, then finally, finally it blocks us off from God and also it blocks us off from other people. And sooner or later, under those conditions, we end up getting drunk over it. So certainly we can see where at the very least we're going to have to work on some resentments if we want the serenity, peace of mind, and happiness necessary for good, long-term sobriety. Joe? Now this morning I want to emphasize two things, and one is that this uh, inventory process that we're talking about is probably the most positive happening that could ever that I could ever do for myself so I I try not to look at this inventory as a negative thing it's the most positive thing I could possibly do in fact our book says on page 53 which you don't need to turn there at this time but it says this is the most magnificent attribute of an alcoholic or any individual is the ability to look at ourselves and that's what we need to do it's what we're doing here so it's the most positive thing we can do and the other thing before we look into the review of of the fears is that This is not an attempt to psychoanalyze ourselves. We're going to just find the facts and face the facts and accept the facts as they are. Again, not an attempt to psychoanalyze ourselves because we can get into a lot of trouble doing that. Now I'm going to read something to you which tells my whole story. It has to do with fears. And and this is on page 18, and please, you don't have to turn it. I'll just read it to you because we're going to start on page 67. But it says an illness of this sort, and we've come to believe in an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. 
If a person has cancer, all is sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, and anyone can increase the list. In other words, what that's saying is that alcoholism is a family illness. It affects everybody in the family to some extent. And I know today that my dad was an alcoholic, and I didn't know that then. I knew he drank a lot. But my dad had an obsession to drink, and my mother had an obsession to see that he didn't drink. And that caused an awful lot of problems in my family. And I was just a little old kid, and my dad's drinking got to be real bad, really bad. He became very verbally abusive and physically abusive to my mother when I was young. And I knew why he was doing it, because he was drinking. And she retaliated, and they argued and fussed a lot, called the police a lot, had lots of arguments a lot. And I grew up in this. It affected me emotionally. And my dad's drinking got to be so bad that my mother had to have him arrested and committed to the Eastern State Hospital in Benita, our local nut house, for alcoholic insanity. And he was to be in the criminally insane ward for three years and seven months and 13 days. And that's what they did with alcoholics in 1949, 50, and 51. That's what they could have done with us had we been living in those times and drinking in those times. That's what they did with him. And I grew up in this. And I used to have to go up there every month or so and hitchhike up there and take him a couple of dollars and a carton of cigarettes. And I'd go into the criminally insane ward and I'd see men in their, some of them were in diapers from their drinking. They had leather straps strapped behind them and straps <clears throat> into, their, <clears throat> into their mouth to keep them biting their tongues off. So I knew about alcoholism as a very young boy, and I grew up in this. And as I would leave there, I would think, my dad's there for his drinking, and I'll never be like this. And I hated drinking, and I hated him for him being in there. You see, that's why it was a moral issue to me. I hated it, and I hated him, and I hated my life being the way it was. And I, and I made a lot of decisions on those roads back and forth. And one of them was, if God was going to do this to me, then to hell with God. That was one of the things that come to me. All by myself, you know. We're real, pretty good at figuring things out. And another, another thing I said to myself, it looks like if it's going to happen in this world, it's going to happen because I made it that way. I'm not going to have any help doing anything. So from this day forward, I'm not going to feel anything. I'm not going to accept any help from anybody. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because I make it that way. And that's the way I live my life. And if people got into my way from what I wanted, then they had to get out of my way. And I'd push them out of my way. And people, every time I was threatened by anybody from getting what I wanted, then I would retaliate on them. And I became a very mean, vicious, angry, hateful, resentful person as a result of that. As I said yesterday, with that attitude, they put you in jail for that. They put you in prison for that. They divorce you for that. They shoot at you for that. They try to stab you for that. That's what they did with me. And I became very, very angry, very, very resentful person. And when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, see, all the time I'm thinking I'm a very brave person and never thought that I had any fear. I thought all this way of life was a very brave thing to do. But when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous and began to look at my lifestyle, and begin to look at these ideas, emotions, and attitudes that Dr. Yoon talked about, I begin to see that I was a very, very fearful individual, and I did not know that. I thought I was a very brave person. And I didn't know that until I was able to look at myself honestly, face the facts, and find the facts, and to look at myself honestly, and to see where these emotions come from. And as I, like I said, as I grew, these emotions grew with me. And I got bigger and got into a lot of trouble. I was a very fearful, angry, resentful hurt person when I got here. On the bottom page of 67, it says, Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Miss Jones, the employer, and the wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. 
but did not weigh ourselves, set the ball rolling. Sometimes we think that fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. Now, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because that self-reliance had failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. See, I was a very self-reliant person. I didn't need God, nothing, or nobody. And that failed me. Totally, totally defeated. My attitude was totally defeated by the time I got here. And I didn't know what to do or which way to turn other than this program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the God of my understanding. And I was able to look at these fears honestly and openly, and I could see that my self-reliant attitude was what had almost destroyed me. Sure. You know, as we uh, <clears throat> grow up and as we become adults and as we go through life, we find that really we human beings only have about one of three things that we can really depend upon. You know, we can depend upon God, we can depend upon other people, or we can depend upon ourselves. And most of we alcoholics, as we grew up, we begin to separate ourselves from God. We begin to separate ourselves from other people. And we became what we thought were very, very self-reliant human beings. And most of us had the same attitude that Joe had. We didn't need God. We didn't need anybody else. By golly, we could do it ourselves. And for most of us, for many, many years, we did it by ourselves. But then as our alcoholism progressed, as the drinking got worse and worse and worse, then the ability to do the things necessary for our very own survival became less and less also. And we got to where not only could we not depend upon God, we couldn't depend on other people, nor could we depend upon ourselves anymore. And when you're in that situation, you've got to have a lot of fear. You've got to be eaten up with fear. And then fear begins to control and dominate our thinking. And fear controls and dominates our actions. And finally, fear controls and dominates our entire lives for us. Now, we've made a decision to let God be the director of our thinking. And if fear directs our thinking, then God can't. So just like with resentments, if we want God to enter that part of our mind and direct our thinking... We're also going to have to do something about these fears, just like we had to about resentments. And again, you can't do anything about a problem till you understand the problem. And I don't think any of us are ever really going to understand that fear and where it comes from and what to do with it until we get it down on a piece of paper and take a real honest look at it. You simply can't do these things in your mind. If we could have, we would have taken care of those things a long time ago. So Bill gives us in that first paragraph on page 68 the same basic set of instructions to look at fear that he did for resentments, except it's just worded a little bit differently, which is his normal way of doing things. So what we did is we made up another sheet of paper. We called it a review of fears, and I hope by now each one of you have one. If not, there's some up here in the front. And they're different than the one that you had in that handout sheet. It's one we have made up and brought along separately. And once again, it has the five columns in it. First column, who or what do I fear? Now, we men, we tend to say, well, we don't have very much fear. We're tough. We're macho. But we're not talking so much about physical fear as we are all those fears that run through our minds. And almost all of us have a lot of fear. We have fears connected with our marriages. We have fears connected with our children. We have fears connected with our jobs. We have fears connected with the police department. We have fears connected with the Internal Revenue Service. We have fears connected with the federal government. We have fears connected with the church, and we could just go on and on and on and list the many, many fears that we human beings have. All we have to do is take them out of our head, 
do column one, just like resentments, top to bottom, while we got one thing and one thing only on our minds. And I was really surprised when I filled out column one to realize how much fear I really did have. Just like resentment, you could only see one fear at a time in your head. And I don't think any of us will really realize how much fear controls and dominates our thinking until we get them all down on a sheet of paper and see how much fear we really do have. Column two, what is the cause of the fear? There's got to be some reason or something behind that fear. What are they going to do to me? Am I perhaps going to go to jail? Am I going to lose something with a material value? Am I going to lose face? Will it result in a divorce? Will it destroy a personal relationship? Might I lose my job? There's got to be a reason behind each fear that we have. Column two, we simply put down the cause of the fear. Now, this is not an attempt to psychoanalyze. You know, I'm not going to say that I'm afraid of the dark because uh, Mother set me on a potty sideways when I was two years old. Just like with resentment, some fear is useful if used for the right purposes. You know, fear brings caution, and fear can keep me from getting hurt. I'm supposed to be a little bit afraid of the dark anyhow. Why? Well, I don't have headlights and I can't see at night. And that brings caution and keeps me from getting hurt. I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Why? Well, I don't have wings and I can't fly. And that keeps me from getting hurt. But if those fears should keep me from going outside after dark or keep me from riding in an elevator, then I better get them down on this sheet of paper and look at them and see what's going on. Most of my fears will be centered around basically one of three things. Nearly every fear that I've got is caused by the fact that I'm scared to death I'm going to lose something I've already got. I'm scared to death that I'm not going to get something that I want. Or I've done something to hurt another human being and I'm scared to death what they're going to do about it whenever they find out. Nearly every one of my fears will have a basic root cause. I simply put down the cause of the fear. Column three. What part of self is affected? Just like with resentment, I can't experience fear unless there's a threat to one of my basic instincts of life. If you do anything to threaten my social instinct in any way, my personal relationships, my self-esteem, it creates fear. If you do anything to threaten my security, material or emotional, it brings fear. If you do anything to threaten my sex life, it brings fear. Once again, as I filled out the third column, I began to see where fear really does come from. Just like with anger, I never knew where anger came from. I never knew where fear came from either. But today I realize fear comes from a threat to one of the basic instincts of life. And also, just like with resentments, I find that it depends upon whether my instincts are under control or what my relationship is with God as to whether I'm going to experience that fear or not. If my instincts are under control, if my relationship with God is okay, you can say and do just about anything you want to to me, and I'm not going to experience any fear from it. But you let my instincts get out of control, my relationship to God go bad, and then just about anything you do to me creates fear. So once again, I begin to realize how important these basic instincts of life are and how important my relationship with God is to determine whether I have to react with fear or not. Fourth column, what did I do? If I didn't do anything to cause that thing that's experiencing the fear, I simply put down nothing or unknown. But in most cases, I'll find that I have done something based on self that puts me in, 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 in the condition of having to experience that fear. Just like I found with most resentments, I had done something based on self. Fourth column, what did I do, if anything, to set the ball rolling and set in motion trains of circumstances which have led to my being in a position to have the fear? 
You know, I'm not afraid of the Internal Revenue Service unless I've done something that I shouldn't have done. I'm not afraid of the police department unless I've done something I shouldn't have done. I'm not afraid of the federal government unless I've done something I shouldn't have done. I'm not even afraid of the church unless I've done something I shouldn't have done. And in almost every fear I can spot what I did to set it in motion, just like with resentments. Fifth column. Where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate? You know, we're now in the fifth column looking at the exact nature of the wrong. The wrong is the fear. That's what's blocking me off from the sunlight of the Spirit. But what's the exact nature of that wrong or that fear? If I had not have been so selfish, I probably wouldn't have been doing those things that put me in a position to experience that fear. If I hadn't have been so dishonest, I wouldn't have been stealing from the internal or cheating the Internal Revenue Service in the first place. If I hadn't been such a frightened individual all my life, I wouldn't be doing those things that experience so much fear or cause me to experience fear. If I was more considerate of other human beings and less selfish, I wouldn't have to experience so much fear. I see the same basic character defects in the fifth column that creates the fear that created the resentment. We'll just use one example, if we can get uh, Glenn to write it for me. One name that I had not only on the resentment sheet, but I also had it on the fear sheet, was the Internal Revenue Service. God, I hated them, but I was scared to death of them too. What was the cause of that fear? Well, they were about to put me in jail. That's why I was so afraid of the Internal Revenue Service. What would that affect? Well, that would affect my self-esteem. That would affect my security. That would affect my sex life. It would affect all my basic instincts of life. Now, what did I do myself to create that fear? Well, I cheated on my income tax. That's what I did. I actually was defrauding the federal government, and I got caught at it. Now, in the fifth column, I can see if I hadn't have been so selfish, if I hadn't have been so dishonest, I wouldn't have been doing that in the first place. And if I hadn't have been doing it in the first place, then they wouldn't have caught me. And if they hadn't have caught me, they wouldn't be trying to throw me in jail. So once again, I see in that fifth column the old character that I had become that causes me to do the things that causes me to experience the fear. Remember, way back in step three, there was a statement that says, we invariably find that we made a decision based on self, which later put us in a position to be hurt. And if we carefully and honestly look at these fears, we'll find in almost all cases that's true. Now you can bet your boots out in column five. If I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, I'm going to keep right on doing the same things I've always done. I'm going to keep right on experiencing the same old fears. And eventually fear will block me off from the sunlight of the Spirit. And it's going to end up causing me to get drunk. So we've done the same thing here we did with resentments. We're doing a part of the fourth step inventory right now. So we'll just put a little four up at the top of the chart. Out in the fifth column, we see the exact nature of the wrong, those things within us that caused it in the first place that we're going to talk to another human being about in step five. In the fifth column... We see the defects of character we're going to become willing to turn loose of in step six. In the fifth column, we see the shortcomings we're going to ask God to take away in step seven. And quite naturally, many of the names in column one will be people and institutions that I've harmed. They will come off of column one. They will go on the list to be used at a later date for steps eight and nine. 
And what really amazed me is that I saw many, many names appearing on both sheets. I resented Barbara, and I feared Barbara. I still fear her a little bit today. If she ever really does find out everything I was doing 26 years ago, she's probably going to file for divorce again. I resented the police department. I feared the police, depart or, part, police department. I resented the Internal Revenue Service. I feared the Internal Revenue Service. I had never tied those things together in my mind. Never had I been able to see how closely resentment and fear resembles each other nor how closely the two were tied together in also almost all cases. I think it's one of the most revealing things we can do for ourselves and really look in our minds, see what's been going on, and see the truth of them. And the amazing thing is, the truth always is, that usually I myself, based on those character defects, put myself in a position to experience the fear and the resentments. And even if I didn't do anything wrong to them, if I wasn't so selfish, I wouldn't have to be afraid anyhow. If I wasn't so afraid of losing what I've got, I wouldn't have to be so afraid. If I wasn't so afraid of not getting what I want, I wouldn't have to be so afraid. I begin to see the root causes of fear just like I see the root causes of resentments. A very revealing thing. Joe? Okay, on page 68, we're going to give a solution to these fears and the emotions of fear. <clears throat> he said, perhaps there's a better way. We think so. For we're now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust our infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role He assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think He would have us and humbly rely on Him does He enable us to match calamity with serenity. Now, we never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think that spirituality is the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it's the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. And here's some more prayer in the fourth step. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And some promises. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. And I seen that when I saw, could see the, the resentful, hateful nature that I had become because of my selfish and, <clears throat> and dishonest and self-seeking, frightening, considerate nature, that I could see that I was relying upon myself, that I needed to rely upon God, that that was the only solution, that I began to turn to God even more so and asking God to direct my attentions and direct my feelings and thoughts and actions. And at once I commenced to outgrow fear to a point that I hardly have any fears left today in those, of those kind. I have other fears, the natural, healthy fears. As Charlie said, I mean, I have the kind of fears that would keep me from walking out in front of a truck, you know. But I have all those old fears that used to keep me awake at night, and I used to worry about, and I used to retaliate at people and become vicious and mean. I don't have those fears anymore as a result of doing these prayers and to being able to look at the, at the fears in, in my life and to see where they came from and to accept them honestly and to face them factually and to ask God to remove them. They're all gone, those types of fears. Now just think, this little file cabinet I had up here in my store yesterday that was filled with fear has now been emptied out. If you think resentments look stupid on paper... Wait till you put your fears on paper. They really look stupid on paper. And probably 95% of them are going to disappear when we see the truth of them and see how dumb they really are. There may be, though, four or five fears that have been embedded so deeply so long that we may have trouble getting rid of them. And Joe just read the second prayer on step four, in step four in the big book. We ask God to remove that fear. Just like we prayed for those we resented, we asked God to remove this fear. And we asked Him what He would have us be instead. And the book promises that once we commence to outgrow that fear. And if we take those fears individually, one at a time, pray for their removal, asking what God wants us to be instead, we are guaranteed that those fears will disappear. 
And I think one of the reasons it works is because prayer, asking God to remove that fear, is one of the greatest acts of courage that we can possibly have. And after a while, courage and faith is going to replace that fear. And to my absolute amazement, again, I realized that I didn't have to go to any other fellowships or read any other books to find faith and courage. If God dwells within me, that's always been a part of my makeup. I just never could use it before. In my chase for money, power, prestige, sex, those things had to be repressed and I had to operate on resentment and anger and fear. But now that the fear is gone, faith and courage can automatically come to the surface. And the part of my mind that used to be filled with fear is now filled with faith and courage. A very positive happening. Nothing negative about this step at all. Two-thirds of my store has now been straightened up. Resentments were removed and replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill. Fear has been removed to the extent God wants it removed and replaced with faith and courage. So automatically I'm in less chance of getting drunk now than I was before I started the inventory process. A very positive thing. Now the third common manifestation of self is the guilt and the remorse that we feel associated with those people we've harmed in the past and those things we've done. And if I want God to direct all my thinking, then we're also going to have to start doing something about that guilt and remorse. And just like with resentments and fear, I can't really do anything about it until I can really see the truth of it. And I can't see the truth of it in my head. I've almost got to go to a sheet of paper to see the truth of these things also. Now it seems as though we human beings hurt other people easier and faster in the sexual area than we do in any other way. Probably the reason for that is because we human beings not only have physical sex, but we also become emotionally involved in sex. You know, the other animals here on earth, they have a sex life too in order to reproduce themselves. But the difference in their sex life and ours is they don't become emotionally involved. Theirs is purely a physical thing. Their sex life is done at God's direction. They don't have self-will. They can't decide whenever they're going to have sex. In most cases, they can't decide who they're going to have sex with. In most cases, they can't decide whether they're going to have sex with one or more. Usually, they can't even decide how many times they're going to do sex. And they can't even decide what position they're going to do it in. That's all done at God's direction. Problems amongst the other animals here on earth. I've never seen a cow on a psychiatrist's couch talking about sexual dysfunction. They just don't have those kind of problems. We human beings are a little bit different. You see, not only did God give us the sex urge to reproduce ourselves, He also made it a very enjoyable thing so we would do so. And at the same time, He gave us the ability to make decisions about sex. You see, we can do sex any time we want to. Any day of the year we want to do it, we can do so. We can choose who we're going to have sex with. And we can decide whether we're going to have it with one or more partners. We can decide how many times we're going to do it, as long as we're capable physically of doing so. And we can even decide what position we're going to do it in. They tell me there's something like 64 different positions a human being can have sex in. I have no idea what they are. I only found three in my lifetime. And two of those damn near killed me. I'm not sure I'm going back to them. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for just a few minutes. Not so much at how we do sex, but as to how we think about sex. 
Because how we think about it determines what we're going to do with it. And that in turn determines whether it's going to hurt other people or not. And then that determines whether we're going to be satisfied with it, whether we're going to be eaten up with guilt, remorse, fear, or whatever. So Bill has given us a very simple way on the next two or three pages to take a little look at our past sex conduct. Bottom of page 68. Joe? This is now about sex. Many of us need an overhauling there, and certainly I needed an overhauling there. And later on in our book, it says that we don't want to be the arbitrator of anyone's sex conduct. So we all have sex problems. We would would be human if we didn't. Well, what can we do about them? Well, I'll tell you about my sex deal, and I'm going to tell you where I got my ideas about sex. And once you hear about where I got my ideas about sex, you will not want to know anything from me about sex. <laughs> and certainly I don't want to be the arbitrator of anyone's sex conduct, and I, don't, and I wouldn't pretend to be, and neither does Charlie. And neither did this book. But when I was about 12 or 13 years old, my dad was off in the nut house, and I am home thinking a lot about sex. I mean, I'm thinking a lot about it. You know, it was more than one obsession. And I was thinking a lot about it. So I went to the, my mom, and I said, Mom, what about this sex thing? And she said, Oh, my God, Benny Joe. That's my name, Benny Joe. Benny Joe. Yeah. She said, that's not a very good thing for a 12 or 13-year-old boy to be thinking about. And this is her attitude. She said, it's a dirty, filthy, rotten thing to do, and you ought to save it for the one you love. Think about that. <laughs> well, somehow or another, I just knew that wasn't right. Okay? So I went to the only source of information that was available to me. And in West Tulsa, Oklahoma... In front of the Jenkins Cafe, there was a group of young men and lady and women, about 15, 16 years old, who were extremely wise and intelligent about the ways of the world, and they knew everything there was about to know about everything. And they told me all about it. And these guys were telling me that they were having sex with these gals sometimes eight and ten times a night, they said. And sometimes with two or three different women a night, they said. Now, the fallacy of all this was that I was sober three or four years in Alcoholics Anonymous before I figured out that they were lying to me. I hope they were lying to me. But, but the point is, I based my sex life upon what they were telling me. That's the only thing that I had to base my sex life on. And I got into a lot of trouble. Now, I told you I've been married and divorced to two women seven times. Now, it wasn't just for drinking. It was drinking and other things. It got into a lot of trouble. And I remember after I got married the first time, and, and it was a, a while, I went out on my wife, and I remember as if it was yesterday. That really did hurt me. I mean, it really did hurt. And I told myself I wouldn't do that anymore, but I didn't not do it anymore. I continued to do it. And later on, I did it again. And it didn't hurt as bad the second time as it did the first. And then the next time it wasn't as bad as, as it was the second time. And on and on and on. It got to where it wasn't, didn't hurt hardly at all. And then I got married again and began to do the same things. And it got to where it didn't hurt at all. See, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was compromising principles. I was compromising myself, and I did not know that. And you see, when you don't have any principles to live by, Ultimately, you don't have any reasons to live. And that's where I found myself. I had compromised every principle known to man and to God, and I didn't even know that I was doing it, you see, until I got this all down on paper and began to look at it. And I can remember it distinctly, the very first time I had sex. And by the way, we had sex education when I was in school, too, but they called it recess. That's it. But I remember the first time I had sex, I was selfish, I was dishonest, I was self-seeking, I was frightened, and, and I was inconsiderate, and I was also alone. <laughs> to think about that. That's why he's wearing glasses today, too. That's what's wrong with him. <laughs> a couple of guys back there jerked those glasses off. I wonder how many of us got our sex education as Joe did. Can I see your hand? Hardly Several of us got it the same way that Joe did. You know, we get here with a spiritual knowledge, 
with the sexual knowledge of 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids. Hell, no wonder we have troubles in the area of spirituality and sex. We learned those things as kids growing up. We tried to make a part of our lives. We get here and we find out that most of that stuff wasn't true in the first place. No wonder we had problems in those areas. No wonder we have trouble with personal relationships. We talk a lot about that. I didn't know how to have a personal relationship with anyone. I never had a single personal relationship with anyone. I didn't know how. I was totally uninformed or ignorant to the facts. I didn't know how. Simply. Now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. Now, you older fellows don't get your hopes up. We're not dealing with physical. We're going to be dealing with emotional sex. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cried that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. I've heard them all my life. They're the ones that say sex is a dirty thing, that you ought to do it at one time in one position with one person only, and the only reason to do it is to reproduce yourself, and if you enjoy it, it's a sinful thing. I've heard them as far back as I can remember. They are extremes on one side. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes, they think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere, and we hear them today. They're the ones that say you ought to be able to have sex anytime you want to, anywhere you want to, with anybody you want to. You ought to be able to enjoy it every time. If you don't, there must be something wrong with you. Maybe they would call that the sexual revolution. The main thing I see wrong with it, it happened 25 years too late for me to participate in any of it. <laughs> One school would allow a man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. Well, we want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? And I read that last statement with great relief, because I knew this book was getting ready to condemn me for what I had been in the past, I knew it was getting ready to tell me what I was going to have to do in the future, and I'd already made up my mind that I wasn't going to pay a bit of attention to it. And I was glad to find that we're not going to be the arbiter of any one sex conduct. You know, this book is meant to be helpful to anybody anywhere when they want to use it. And if we start trying to tell people how they're going to have to do sex, and if we start trying to tell them what's right and wrong in that area, then certainly we're going to alienate people. And besides that, what's sexually acceptable in one part of the world may not be acceptable in another part of the world. So we're not even going to get into that question, period, as to what's right and what's wrong. What we are going to do is see a way to look at our own past sex conduct and see if maybe we've harmed some other people with it and see if maybe we should not develop a new sex life for the future, if necessary, to where we can live with it, still enjoy it, but at the same time not hurt other people. Because if we continue to do some of the same things we've been doing, then sure, certainly we're going to hurt some people. And if we do, then the guilt and the remorse and the fear is going to back up and sooner or later block us off from the sunlight of the Spirit and may end up causing us to get drunk. So Bill gives me about basically the same set of instructions in the next paragraph on how to look at my past sex life as he did for resentment and fear, just worded a little bit differently, which is his way of doing things. We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. And the book recognizing again, you can't do these things in your head. You've got to get it on paper to see the truth of it. So we made up another little sheet. It looks just like the resentment sheet, only we called it a review of my own sex conduct. Not somebody else's, but my own sex conduct. Column one, who did I hurt? I doubt if there's anybody in this room this morning that's ever hurt anybody in a sexual area that we don't know exactly who it was. 
That seems to be a form of knowledge that we all have. There may be some question as to what do we do to hurt people. And I guess we hurt people in many ways in the sexual area. You know, if I'm in a married relationship like I am, I go outside of my marriage and have sex out there, and my wife finds out about that, then surely I've created a problem for her. If not physically, at least emotionally. If there's children in my home, and what I did out there creates a serious problem between my wife and I, then I've hurt my children by the same act. If the lady I had sex with out there, if it becomes common knowledge, I've hurt her too. And if she has a husband and children, I've hurt them. One sex act could hurt many, many people. Not always directly, but in many cases indirectly. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area simply by demanding more than our fair share. Maybe our partner isn't too ready to go every time we want them to. And rather than consider their needs, wants, and desires, we selfishly demand that they have sex with us when they don't want to do that. Surely we create a problem for them when we do that, if not physically, at least emotionally. Sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area by demanding they do things with us that they really don't want to do. And again, rather than consider their needs, wants, and desires, we selfishly demand that they do those things with us. Surely we create a problem for them, if not physically, at least emotionally. Sometimes I think we hurt people in a sexual area simply by withholding sex. Maybe we're not too keen to go every time our partner wants to. And sometimes, rather than consider their needs, wants, and desires, we selfishly withhold sex when maybe we ought to give in a little more often. Many ways we hurt people in a sexual area. I think we all know what they are. I think we know who we've hurt. Column one, who did I hurt? Column two, what did I do? Column three, affects mine. Which part of self caused me to do what I did? Was it caused by the social instinct, the security instinct, or the sex instinct? Now you would think if I hurt anybody in a sexual area, it would be caused by the sex instinct. And probably once in a while that's true. Maybe to get the uh, emotional and physical gratification that comes at the moment of successful completion of the sex act. Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing at the wrong time with the wrong person because of the sex instinct. But I think if we very carefully review these things and look at them honestly, I think we're going to find in most cases the other two instincts are involved just as much or more and maybe sex really didn't have a hell of a lot to do with some of this stuff. For instance, we boys found at a very early age that you can build your self-esteem through sex. After all, the more members of the opposite sex you can attract to yourself, the greater man you really are, we thought. And we boys call that John Wayneism. I don't know what you girls called it. Jane Wayne. But some... <laughs> Some of you tell me you use sex for the same purposes. Now, I'm going to express an opinion, and I want to make it clear it's just my opinion. Not Joe's opinion, not AA's opinion, not anybody else's opinion, just mine. I'm convinced that God gave us the sex urge so that we would reproduce ourselves. If we didn't have that and didn't reproduce ourselves, the human race would fail to survive. I'm also convinced that he made it a very pleasurable thing. So we would do so. I just don't think you and I would do the amount of work involved in sex if we didn't get something out of it. And it is one of the most pleasurable things a human being can do. Now, if we're doing sex for purposes other than reproduction or enjoyment, maybe we're doing sex for reasons or purposes other than what God intended for instance, if I'm using sex to build my self-esteem, that has nothing to do with the sex instinct. That falls under the social instinct, building my self-esteem through sex, and sex really doesn't have anything to do with that. Now, sometimes we use sex to buy a personal relationship. Maybe we're just lonesome. Maybe we just want somebody to pay attention to us. And we give sex to buy back a personal relationship. Now, if that's what we're doing with sex, that's not to reproduce, that's not to enjoy, that's also to fulfill a part of the social instinct and also emotional security. Sex really doesn't have much to do with that. 
Sometimes we use sex to buy material security. Maybe we're in a sexual situation we'd really rather not even be in. But we become so overly dependent upon another human being for our material well-being, we give sex to buy back material security. That has nothing to do with reproduction and enjoyment. That's to fulfill the security instinct. Sometimes we use sex to get even with another human being. Maybe we found out our partner's done something they shouldn't do, and we say, we'll show them. And we go out and do the same identical thing to get even with them. And the fallacy in it is, is after we've done it, we can't afford to tell them we did it. But there, we didn't use sex to reproduce nor to enjoy. We used it to get even with another human being. Sex really doesn't have much to do with that. Sometimes we use sex to force our will on another human being. Yeah, maybe our partner isn't doing what we think they ought to do. And we say, we'll show them. We'll just cut them off at the pass, and we won't let them have any until they come around our way of thinking. Now, we boys aren't too good at that. We only last about three days. But you girls have honed it to perfection. You know exactly how to do that. And I don't blame you. I'd use it that way, too, if it worked for me. That has nothing to do with reproduction or enjoyment. That's to force our will on another human being. Sex really doesn't have much to do with that. I was absolutely amazed when I began to look into that third column to see what I had really been doing with sex. Two things happened to me almost immediately. The first thing that happened to me is a lot of my guilt began to disappear. I thought I was just a dirty, rotten, no good SOB. But I found out that I did those things sexually that were wrong, that hurt other people. Not because of a bad human being, but because of a sick human being. And I used sex for purposes other than what God intended to fulfill the social instinct, the security instinct, even more than I did the sex instinct. And when I began to see that, it began to look kind of dumb to use sex for those purposes. And I began to get a little bit of a handle on this sexual thing. I began to see that if that's what I'm using sex for, and sex really doesn't have anything to do with that, then it's kind of dumb to go out there and do those kind of things. And that desire to go do it at the wrong time in the wrong place with the wrong people began to become less and less and less. You see, I always thought I was oversexed. No, I wasn't oversexed. I was under secure. And I used sex to build my security and to build my self-esteem. And I don't think any of us are going to see that until we get it down on this paper and honestly look at it. Column four. What feelings did I create in others? Just like the book said, did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? What should I have done instead? We put this down on paper and look at it in each particular case. What should I have done instead of what I did do? Column five. What's the exact nature of the wrong? Now, the wrong is the harm that I've done to another human being. Well, what's the exact nature of it? What's within me that causes me to do those things in the first place? I see the same basic character defects. If I hadn't have been so selfish, I probably wouldn't have been doing some of those things I was doing that hurt other people. If I hadn't have been so dishonest, I wouldn't have been out there sneaking around behind my wife's back, lying to her all the time. If I hadn't have been so afraid of facing life without that extramarital sex, without that extra thrill, without that thing that comes from that, I might not have been doing those things in the first place. If I'd been more considerate of my wife and my children, I wouldn't be putting myself in positions that end up hurting them, which in turn causes me problems. Same basic character defects creates the sexual harms it does any other. Now, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, I'm going to keep right on doing the same things over and over and over again, hurting other people, then experiencing the guilt and the remorse and the fear associated with it. Sooner or later, it blocks me off from the sunlight of the Spirit, and I end up getting drunk over it. So we look at the sex thing just like we did resentments, just like we did fears. This is not a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items. It's simply a review of our own past sex conduct. Joe? Okay, it says on um, page 69 in this way, the way Charlie just described, the way the book just described, 
In this way, we tried to shape a sane inside, sane ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? The book doesn't care how you do sex. If you want to do sex, hang it upside down from a tree limb by your toenails. That's fine with the book. But if you force another human being to do it in the same manner that they don't want to, that might be for selfish purposes. That's the main thing. Is it for purely selfish reasons or not? And we're going to use prayer three different times in this area of sex. And the first one is here. It said, we ask God to mold our ideals and to help us to live up to them. Remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good. Neither, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must willing, be willing to make amends where we've done harm, provided we are not, provided we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. Here's some more prayer. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. Now, God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with others is often desirable. But we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. You know, this is an area that I don't think we, uh, we need a whole lot of advice anyhow. Uh, I think all of us pretty well know what we should do and what we shouldn't be doing. About all we really need to do is just listen to that inner voice and let it kind of direct us as to what we ought to do. You know, I have many, many people come to me in this sex, sex area and they'll ask me a question about it and my usual answer is, well, what do you think? What do you think you ought to be doing? And invariably, if they're truthful, they already know the answer. You know, we avoid trying to get sexual advice from too many people. Some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose about sex. Besides that, I can't think of a worse place in the world to get sexual advice than among the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> now, that's an area I don't think any of us are too damn competent in the first place. Maybe we ought to just listen to that little inner voice. It usually knows what we ought to be doing. I says, suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean that we're going to get drunk? Well, some people tell us so, but this is only a half-truth. It depends on us and our motives. Now, if we're sorry for what we have done and have an honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we'll be half forgiven and have learned our lesson. Now, if we're not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. So we're not theorizing. These are facts of our experience. Now, to sum up about sex, more prayer. We earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. And this takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the horny condition, oh, excuse me, it quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. Old Bill used some pretty fancy words in here, didn't he? He could have, he could have said horny condition just as easily. Okay, here's what we've done on this sex inventory now. Same thing as with resentments and fear. We're in the process of doing step four at the present time, so we just put a little four up at the top of that sheet. Again, out in the fifth column, we see the exact nature of the wrong that we're going to discuss with another human being. We see the character defects we're going to be in step five. We see the character defects we're going to become willing to turn loose of in step six. We see the shortcomings we're going to ask God to take away in step seven. And quite naturally, all the names on column one on this sheet will come off of this sheet and go on the list to be used at a later date for steps eight and nine. And again, I was absolutely amazed to see the same names appearing on all three of these sheets in many cases. Barbara was most certainly on all three of these sheets. Various other different names appeared on all three sheets too. Never had really tied that together in my head until I put it all down on paper and looked at it. A very revealing thing. Now we're going to suggest you do one more thing. The book doesn't say to do it here, but sooner or later it has to be done. 
We've made up another little sheet and we're handing it out now that is a review of harms other than sexual. And if we'll go ahead and list all these other names and people we've hurt in any other way other than sex. Column one, who did it hurt? Column two, what did it do? Column three, what part of self is affected? Column four, what feelings did I create in others? Column five, what's the exact nature of the wrong? If I'll do that, then when I'm through with this sheet, I will have all the people I've harmed in any way, period. And when I get to steps eight and nine, I'll have the complete list. I'll not only see who I've harmed, but in all cases, I'll see the part that I've played in it. And if I can see the part that I've played in each one of these harms, then it's going to make it a lot easier for me to make my amends later on when I get to steps eight and nine. But if I don't see the truth about those harms, see the part that I really played and what part of self caused me to do that, then it's much, much harder to make those amends. You see, some of those people, I didn't even know I'd hurt them because I had covered it up with resentments for such a long period of time. But if we do this inventory the way the book says, we not only end up with all the people we've hurt, uh, we see what caused us to do it, the part we played in it, and it's going to make it much easier to do eight and nine when we get to it. So we'll do this other sheet just like we did the others, and when we're through with it, then we'll have the entire list. Page 70, last paragraph. If we've been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. Now, you see the word analyze. A lot of people say utilize, don't analyze. But here's the word analyze in the book. To analyze something seems simply means to get down to, to the truth of it. You know, we have taken a searching, fearless, moral, truthful, analytical inventory. We've gotten down to the truth of all these things. He didn't say so, but we've listed and analyzed our fears. We've listed and analyzed our people we've hurt by our sex conduct. We've listed and analyzed people we've hurt in any other way. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies. For we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we've hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. You know, we said all along, this is a positive happening. My God, if you and I have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, this is a hell of a personality change already. See, we don't have to wait till step 12 to get something out of this. Each step brings something good for us. We're beginning to change. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove, or move, remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from Him. If you've already made a decision, which is step three, and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, which is step four, you've made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Now, I think the book recognizes here in step four we're not going to do a perfect job. We've listed and analyzed our grosser handicaps. What are the grosser handicaps? Resentment, fear, guilt, and remorse. What are the grosser handicaps? Selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate. The kind of character we have become, those old character defects. We've looked at all those things. We've listed them. We've analyzed them. I think one of the mistakes in AA today is everybody's sitting around waiting until they get well before they take step four because they want to take it perfect. And you can't take it perfect. We do the best we can in step four. This is removed enough from us to allow us to get on with the rest of the steps. There's another step later on that's going to continue this inventory process. We're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives. 
And as time goes by, we'll learn more and more and more about it. Really, I think these gross handicaps, it's about, that's about 100% for me anyhow. As I look back through my life, I've never, I can't spot an emotional problem that didn't evidence itself in one of three ways. I was mad in hell at something or somebody. I was scared to death about something. Or I'd done something I shouldn't have been doing and guilt and remorse was eating me up. As I project into the future, I don't see any emotional problem coming up that won't revolve around one of those three things. Matter in hell, scared to death, or eaten up with guilt and remorse. This thing is pretty well complete for people like me. Now, I don't know whether you all have noticed or not, but have you ever noticed that nearly all the information in the big book on sex is on page 69? <laughs> I don't know that that means anything, but that's where most of it really is. You want to tell them about the young lady? Yeah, this young lady, she's having a lot of trouble with sex when she got sober, been sober about six or eight months, and she went to her sponsor, and she said, Sponsor said, since I've been sober, I've had a lot of problems with this sexual relations, and I just don't know how to do sex when I'm sober. I always did it when I was drunk. She said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You go back home, and you get out your big book. You turn to page 69, and on page 69, we'll tell you all you need to know about sex and what to do about it. She said, fine, thank you. So she went back home and she got out her big book. And she forgot the page numbers. Instead of paying, turning to page 69, she paid, turned to page 96. And she began to read there. So let's turn to page 96 and see what she read. That's one of the most appropriate things I've ever read. It just goes on and on and on. <laughs> A little humor in the book if you can find it. There's places. Okay. We've now, we've now finished up our inventory. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.